Who you marry might be the most important decision of your life, but it can also be the least rational. Maybe loneliness plays a role, maybe lust, maybe forces we don't grasp at all. It's guesswork and blind intuition. He was quite excited and kept saying, I can't wait to be married to you and just, I'm so in love with you and so on. I was a little more nervous. Deborah is a successful interior designer. She tells everybody about the handsome doctor she met online who seems to live only for her. We would take a walk. He would hold my hand and want to hear all about my day. John makes her feel alive again. He came off as the perfect husband. But her family doesn't like John. To be honest, his story about having the three cars in the house, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I called BS on that. Like why does a practicing anesthesiologist never seem to have any money? When he leaves the house in his blue surgical scrubs, where does he go all day? I would try to look him in the eye and he would try to look away. So that just kind of says something about somebody. John tells her the problem is with her children. They're spoiled, trying to sabotage her happiness. They want her money. And her psychologist tells her she needs to establish boundaries with her children. But is there something about John's past he's trying to hide? I opened the mailbox and there was a letter from a guy from jail. I thought, why is he getting a letter from someone from, from jail? Devil's got the boyfriend. He's got the one who said he'd always love you. He'd never leave you. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is Dirty John, a new podcast premiering this fall. I'm Christopher Gofford, a reporter with the LA Times. I got a big smile on my face, and you know why? Why, John? Because, because trust me. Just trust me. Just why? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it don't happen. You will understand when the time comes. Dirty John is a story about seduction and deception. It's about family and forgiveness and the borderland between love and death. It's the kind of thing where you look at somebody and you swear, you swear you can hear, you can literally hear the seething cauldron that's inside their brain. Trust you what? Subscribe to Dirty John on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening app. A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. There are a total of 13 stab wounds which, which have penetrated the body. They are all arbitrarily numbered from 1 to 13. There are eight wounds noted in the left side and upper back in the shoulder and scapular area where wound number one is on the top of the left shoulder. I'm sitting in the office of a man who prosecutes murders for a living. His name is Matt Murphy. He's a veteran assistant district attorney who handles homicides out of Newport Beach, California. If you're from somewhere else and have a mental picture of Orange County about an hour south of L.A., Newport Beach is probably part of that image. It's the side of the county that the tourist guides want you to see. Pacific Coast Highway runs through it, luxury shopping, piers and surf shops and plastic surgeons, yachts and cliffside mansions. I used to cover the city as a crime reporter for a local newspaper. There weren't a lot of murders, maybe one a year, two or three in a very bad year. Greed or lust figured prominently in the most memorable ones. These days, if you're one of the rare people who meet a violent death in Newport Beach... Matt Murphy is the prosecutor who will hear about it. The homicide case that landed on his desk in the summer of 2016 was particularly violent, and it was unique in his experience. Number five is on the left, more to the upper arm area. Number six, seven, and eight are close to the midline region of the upper back. All of these stab wounds are superficial wounds. They have all been sutured by metallic staple sutures. Murphy is reading the autopsy report, which is part of how he assesses whether there's a prosecutable offense. A homicide is the killing of one human being by another. He had to decide whether it was a crime. Wound number 13, which is the fatal wound, is the upper left eyelid, one centimeter in size. Only wound number nine has some bruising around it and, then, and another bruise noted around 12 and 13. 
So when you, when you review something like this, what it tells you is this young woman fought like hell. Nothing is more essential than protecting your home. But getting traditional home security can be a punishing and expensive task. Now, there's a better way. You can protect your whole home with Simply Safe Home Security. Simply Safe has gotten rid of everything that makes home security a hassle. They make it easy for you. And I should know, I've been a Simply Safe user for a while now. No landlines, no hassles. I can check on things from my phone or office, and installation was literally as easy as using double stick tape. Simply Safe has no long term contract. You're never locked in. Around the clock, your home's protected by best in industry 24 7 professional monitoring, all for just $15 a month. That's three times less than the other guys. And with Simply Safe, there's no hidden fees. Protect your home today. Go to simplysafe.com slash John and get a special 10% discount when you order today. That's simplysafe.com slash John for 10% off your order. Simplysafe.com slash John. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is Dirty John. I'm Christopher Gofford. Part 1. The Real Thing In the fall of 2014, Deborah Newell was flipping through profiles on Our Time, a dating site for singles over 50. 84 strangers wanted to get to know her. She took a chance on three guys. She had coffee with one, dinner with another, breakfast with a third. They were older and less handsome than their profile pictures. There wasn't any chemistry. Deborah Newell has hazel eyes and high cheekbones and wavy blonde hair. When she was in her 30s, a man threw himself on the hood of her car, begging for a date. For years, attracting men had been as easy as walking into a room. Now she was 59, married and divorced four times. Her four kids were grown, and she had a flourishing interior design business. She wanted a man to travel with and share her success with. She worried that she was too old for another chance at love. She tried the site again. Someone else wanted to meet her. This guy checked every box. Looked very successful, according to everything in his profile. He posted a few pictures, said he was a physician. So I thought, hmm, interesting. Seems safe. So we started talking. John Michael Meehan had thick, dark hair and a big, warm, friendly smile that invited trust. If you saw his smile on a billboard, you'd want whatever he was selling. He looked a little weathered, but he might have once been an All-American quarterback on a trading card. They exchanged texts, then phone calls. He said, you are so my type. And the last guy just w- I was with said I wasn't his type. And I thought, oh, I'm so his type. Well, okay, good. That's a good thing. <laughs> and he sent me pictures of him as a little boy, said he was a Christian, said that he had gone to my church, said I go to Mariners, where do you go? And he goes, that's where I go said that I had four kids and grandkids. He goes, oh, how lucky you are. I would love to meet them. She lived in Irvine, about an hour south of Los Angeles. They met at her penthouse. She grabbed her Chanel bag, and they walked down the block to a casual dining restaurant called Houston's, where they found a place at the bar. John was 55, six foot two with broad shoulders. He had flawless teeth, a strong jaw, and hazel green eyes. He focused on her intently. Deborah wore black Gucci stiletto heels and designer jeans. John seemed to care almost nothing about his clothes. He looked like an overgrown college guy with his preppy shirt and his shorts and I don't know. Like a frat guy had never grown up? Yeah, exactly. That's what he looked like. He was smart and charming and articulate. He was divorced with two daughters. He said he had houses in Newport Beach and Palm Springs, that he was an anesthesiologist just back from a year in Iraq where he had worked with Doctors Without Borders. He told stories about being on the front line, 
jumping out of a helicopter. We just talked about what we wanted out of life. He asked a lot of questions about my business and how it works. I thought it was a good trait that he's more interested in me than himself. I think it's healthy when the conversation goes back and forth. She was still stung by her last boyfriend, who had complained that she'd put on some weight. But John told her that she was beautiful, that she stopped his heart. Remember him rubbing my back? As you're sitting side by side? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. He moved very fast. They kissed that night back at her place. He wanted it to go further. He did not want to leave. He even threw himself on her bed and said, This feels incredible. She was getting uncomfortable. She had to insist he leave. She had to kick him out. The next day, she was back at her office, a little sad. She tried to lose herself in her work. There were always deadlines. She'd spent 30 years building her business, Ambrosia Interior Design, and she was a name in her field. She supervised a team of devoted designers, marketers, and project managers. She liked to hire single women and mothers because she could remember how it felt to be alone with one child and another on the way after her first marriage broke up. She took me through her storage warehouse in Irvine. It's as big as a supermarket and crammed with sofas, modern art, mirrors, frames, and a thousand other furnishings. She drums her fingers on an elegant object in the shape of an inflated blowfish. It looks to me like a vase, but she calls it a ceramic decorative ball. Um, If it's a white and cream scheme, they pull a lot of white. If it's a gray, more of a restoration look, they pull those. So it just depends on the scheme. When people walk into one of Deborah Newell's model homes, they're invited to imagine their futures in them. She calls them approachable dreams. Her warm, flawless rooms are like glossy ads in upscale lifestyle magazines. No kids' toys or dirty dishes in sight. None of the messiness of actual living. One whole section of Deborah's warehouse is shelf after shelf of hardback books coordinated by color because books make nice furniture in perfect homes. A little nod to culture, though, the pages inside might as well be blank. Can you explain the books again? The books we pull by color. Like, let's say it's a blue and beige scheme. Cream will pull blue and beige and cream books. So depending on what the color scheme is. And where do you get them? (laughs) Libraries. I go around on Saturdays and collect books. <laughs> I love to read, and it's really become something that's a little bit of a hobby of mine to go around and find books. So, aqua books, blue books, navy books, uh-huh. white, gray, yellow, Where's brown, this? and the books themselves don't matter. Well, we don't want anything that says death or sex on it. <laughs> so we have to stay away from those. <laughs> and then the guys Did you make up those the... rules yourself? No, the builders did. It's like the face you show someone on a date. You're inviting someone to fantasize about the peace that may complete his or her life. If your eagerness or loneliness or desperation show too soon, you're done. Maybe that had been John's mistake. One of Deborah's daughters was working with her on the day after her disastrous date with him. She told her about it. I thought, what a jerk. <laughs> You're like, I can so eliminate him. I can guy. eliminate him. <laughs> Later that day, John called her. He told her he was sorry. He knew he'd overstepped. He just wanted to spend every minute with her. Would she give him another chance? I was still attracted to him. So... I was curious to hear what he had to say. And of course, he persuaded me. John had some idiosyncrasies. He showed up for dates in his faded blue medical scrubs as if fresh from surgery. He even wore them to a formal dress cancer benefit she invited him to. Some people snickered, but she thought, busy doctor. By the second or third date, he was telling her he loved her, that he wanted to marry her. Two weeks after they met, she emailed him. So you are the real thing, with a smiley face emoji. And he replied, Best thing that will ever happen to you. Handsome, oh, so handsome. Gentle and sweet, 
Toss me off my feet every time I see him Handsome, handsome man He began spending the night regularly at her Irvine penthouse. This alarmed her 24-year-old daughter Jacqueline, who lived there with her. Jacqueline thought he looked homeless. She remembered the first time she saw him at their place. Well, the second I opened the door, I just kind of looked at him head to toe and thought to myself, oh, this loser. He didn't carry himself very well. His body was kind of moping around. He looked very focused. His eyes were going from one corner of the room to the other as if he was scanning, thinking pretty hard about something. He had a lot going on in his mind, but um, he was pretty calm. Even at a glance, Deborah Newell's penthouse reflected money. There were black velvet dining chairs, a glass cocktail table, fine art on the walls, including two original Salvador Dali paintings. Jacqueline had a collection of expensive bags and purses. I have a safe where I keep Birkin bags and, like, my nicer purses. And I had it in my office area, and he walked in and said, what do you have in the safe, kiddo? And I said, none of your business. And I slid the door closed behind him. I believe that was my second interaction with him. And then I told my mom that she better get this creep out of the house or I don't plan on living with her. Deborah wasn't surprised by the criticism. She often exasperated her kids with her taste in men. They found something bad to say about anyone she dated. They'd seen her endure one bad relationship after another. Over the years, men had yelled at her, hit her, and taken her money. Soon, she and John were quietly looking for a place together. They found a house on the boardwalk on Balboa Island in Newport Beach. The rent was $6,500 a month. She put down a year in advance. He didn't want his name on the lease. Tax problems, he said. After Jacqueline's overt hostility, Deborah wasn't about to tell her kids that John would be moving in with her. She knew what they'd say, that she was moving too fast, acting with her heart, repeating old mistakes. What her kids didn't see was how well he treated her day by day, better than her husband's had. How he brought her coffee in the morning and got her groceries. How he took her Tesla and Range Rover in for maintenance. Sometimes he even carried her purse for her. She was convinced that they'd understand how wonderful he was once they got to know him. And she knew that if any of her kids would give him a chance, it was her youngest, Tara. Tara Newell was 23 and as quiet and non-confrontational as her sister Jacqueline was assertive. If Jacqueline was the streetwise family rebel, Tara was the pleaser. The first word people used to describe her was sweet. Tara was into dogs and zombie shows, church and country music. She had Psalm 23 tattooed on her foot. She had her mom's blonde hair and soft manner. She was an avid hiker, fit but physically small, with a gentleness that made her seem smaller still. She was living outside Vegas with her boyfriend. They'd met at a pet store where they'd both worked and had bonded over the walking dead. Tara was taking online dog grooming classes. For years, Tara had watched men come in and out of her mom's life. She knew her mom liked to take care of people and tried to see the best in them. Sometimes she trusted too easily. So Tara felt protective of her mom. She liked Christians. And some men would lie and say they were a Christian just to charm her. And they would go to church with her, but they wouldn't be involved or have a personal connection with the Lord. Tara wondered why a guy who sounded as good as John would still be single. She wanted to have a look at him. A few days before Thanksgiving, Tara and her boyfriend, Jimmy Grob, drove out to Southern California for a few days. John was helping Deborah move into her new rental house on the water. At six foot two, John was physically imposing, and he towered over Tara by a full foot. My first impression of this guy we walked in, and he just didn't really want to say hi to us. We tried to say hi to him. He gave us like a quick 
high and we tried to help him move and stuff. She had her three dogs with her, including her miniature Australian shepherd, Cash. We went into the house. We had the dogs there and stuff, and they were roaming around. They were very anxious, picking up probably from my energy from John, and John's energy just, he wasn't thrilled to meet us. I just thought maybe he might be shy or something else might be going on. Jimmy thought John's behavior was odd. He huffed and strained as he tried to move Deborah's queen mattress single-handedly. He'd try to throw the mattress a few feet in front of him, you know, wrestle it down the stairs and onto the car. It was just, it wasn't taking any help. Me and Tara and someone else were there, and we're, we're looking at each other like, is this guy for real right now? <laughs> like, he's just really overdoing it for no reason. It seemed like he was trying to impress us or, or Debbie or, or both. You know, just some kind of ego trip that, that he had. While Tara and Jimmy were staying in Deborah's spare bedroom, Deborah was trying to maintain the illusion that John wasn't really living there. He'd moved in after knowing her just five weeks. Here's Tara. About the second day we stayed there, I went into her bathroom to get some Q-tips, and his stuff was just all there. And then I questioned her about it. I was like, why is his stuff here? He told me he wasn't moving in because he only known her for two months. And she couldn't shake a few questions. If he had houses in Newport Beach and Palm Springs, Why had no one been allowed to see them? Why was he always driving mom's cars instead of his own car? Why did he seem to spend all day playing Call of Duty on the 70-inch plasma TV mom had bought for the house? If he was a doctor, why did he seem to own nothing but a few old clothes? Two thousand eighteen. It's coming sooner than you think. And every year, there's that one idea that just keeps sticking around in your brain. Will 2018 be the year you finally decide to listen to you? Because ignoring that thing will not make it go away. The only way to quench that thirst is to actually create something. And creators everywhere turn to Squarespace. Between beautiful templates created by world-class designers, full customization, and everything optimized for mobile right out of the box, Squarespace is the easiest way to turn that one idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you'd like to support Dirty John and you want to hear more shows like it, then please, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code DIRTYJOHN to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. The future is coming, and you can make it brighter with Squarespace. If you've been thinking about your home security, there's no better time to get it than right now. You've heard me tell you about Simply Safe Home Security. It's the best protection, period. Simply Safe has put together a massive security arsenal for your home. A special package handpicked just for you. Entry sensors, motion sensors, glass break sensors, everything you need to stop criminals from ever touching your home. I switched to Simply Safe when I realized my old security system was the only reason I still had a landline. I wanted something easier and more affordable, and Simply Safe delivered. It's wireless, mobile enabled, easy to install. My wife and I know that our home and family are protected. With Simply Safe, there are no contracts, no commitments, just complete protection for your home. It's hard to put a price on that kind of peace of mind. And for the holidays, our friends at Simply Safe are giving you an incredible offer. Right now, you can get $200 off this special security package. Go to simplysafe.com slash John. That's simplysafe.com slash John to save $200 on this Simply Safe security pick. Simplysafe.com slash John. I was just confused because, to be honest, his story about having the three cars in the house, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I called BS on that. Tara was looking through a closet when she found a box of John's stuff. There was a nursing certificate with his name on it. I don't know the medical field that much, so I just thought he had a nursing certificate on top of an anesthesiologist degree or whatever. And I said, oh, I found his nursing certificate to my mom. Like, how do you think he's not moving in here? She told me he was getting his stuff 
or she was getting his stuff framed for him. And um, that's why I was there. Tara wasn't satisfied with the explanation. And she did something Deborah was not accustomed to from her quietest, most docile daughter. For the first time in Tara's life, she lashed out and screamed at her mother. Why was she lying? Why didn't she just admit that he was living there? My mom came up before him, started questioning me, why are you asking me this and stuff? And then he came up right behind her and just started screaming at me. I'm in the back bedroom and I just hear a bunch of yelling and all of a sudden Tara runs to the back bedroom crying hysterically and John isn't too far behind, bursts into the room and it, it just happens so quick, just like the flip of a switch. He was accusing me of wanting to take my mom away from him and also accusing me of snooping through his things, which I didn't. But because he said that, it made me question, what is he trying to hide? I screamed back because I didn't like things he was saying. And when someone's screaming at you, it's hard for you not to have a reaction out of that. He was yelling that she shouldn't have been snooping through his stuff and that his kids would have been punished for this, being spanked and and smacked. He definitely was trying to take control. He was definitely sticking his chest out, trying to take a commanding position. You know, I I had a broken hand at the time, so it was just uh, kind of felt like I couldn't do anything in that moment except stand up for Tara and uh, he he definitely didn't like that I could tell that she was more scared than anything because he uh, was a very brooding uh, male dominant uh, you know personality type before that we hadn't really seen that we'd seen this you know uh, kind of cool suave you know Newport beach looking guy Debbie and John kicked us out that night, and it was just a very emotional, very scary, you know, event. Especially on Thanksgiving, you you'd expect that family would be brought closer together. I even remember telling Debbie as we were walking out, you know, I thought Thanksgiving was about family and not boyfriends, and I can tell that that got to her because I think she was starting to realize who and what she was giving up just for this guy. And we were not welcome there for Thanksgiving because he didn't want us there and he was living there. So that truth came out that he was living there. Yeah, I yelled at her too because I told her, I'm like, how can you let this guy talk to me? But I said it way differently. Um, I screamed at her. I said, how could you let this guy talk to me like this? This is your home. I'm your daughter. I just met him, like, what's going on? And you're going to let me leave over him? So, that day was very hurtful. John had explanations for her kids' hostility to him. They were jealous. They wanted her money. They were waiting for her to die so they could collect. And he had an explanation for why he had a nursing degree but called himself a doctor. He said he also had a Ph.D., which earned him the right to the title, and he had advanced training in anesthesiology. The day after the blowout, the family gathered for the big Thanksgiving party at the Balboa Island house. It was impossible to ignore the sudden fissures in the family, impossible to ignore Tara's absence. But others were willing to give John a chance, like Deborah's mother, Arlene. She adored him. We were standing at the window looking at the ocean and looking at the bay, I should say. And uh, and I was just kind of quizzing him, and he was very nice, very nice. He was, he was, But he never really dressed up. He was just kind of mm-hmm. tacky looking. I thought for Thanksgiving Day, we always dressed up in our family and made a real special day and here he comes down and just looking pretty sloppy but I thought well he works hard and that's okay for him to do that and we just kind of talked about little things and I told Debbie later I said oh I think he's a great guy you know he's just very nice and courteous and he's very kind to me when Jacqueline showed up her cousin told her John wanted to have a private word with her in the alley behind the house 
I was like, oh, hell no, this is not happening right now. I have nothing to say to you. Anything that he wanted to say to me, it could have been said in the house in front of everybody. So I did not appreciate that at all. And that prompted me to say some bad things about him. Like, I think he's the devil and he's just a loser piece of shit. That's what I told everybody. And then I left the home. To John, this was more evidence that Deborah's kids were spoiled and out of control. His words tugged at Deborah's anxiety that maybe they were. She thought she could use a professional's objective advice. She found a psychologist, and the psychologist told her that her kids didn't have a right to run her life. She was 59. If this was the man she'd chosen, it was her business. So then the, the psychologist starts working with me to have boundaries with the girls. So I was told that I have to give them rules, that if they're going to come over, they have to be invited over. They can't just stay without calling first, that I have a right to hang up on them if they're going to yell at me, tell them that I deserve happiness just like you do. You're not going to treat me that way or I'm going to hang up on you. She was just teaching me to not allow them to have behavior like that towards me. And John loved it. That yeah, I agree with you. This is great. Well, devil's got your boyfriend. He's got the one who said he'd always love you. He'd never leave you. Devil's got your boyfriend. He's got the one and he'll never let go. Their house on the boardwalk had floor-to-ceiling windows that made you feel you were sitting atop Newport Harbor. It had a rooftop deck where they could watch the sailboats and the great yachts slide over the waves. John liked to wear baggy sweats and sweatshirts with the logo of the University of Arizona, where he had gotten an undergraduate degree. Everything said Arizona on it. I thought, huh, we're 55 and we're wearing... (laughs) So basically he thought he was a mess in terms of his wardrobe. Yeah. And he had the baggiest pants... She took him to buy a closet full of new clothes. They went to Brooks Brothers. He would try things on, and I'd say, no, go back. <laughs> and he'd come out and something, I like that. <laughs> Let's get that. <laughs> she bought him some shoes, designer jeans, dress shirts, slacks, a black tweed sport coat, some form-fitting cashmere sweaters, deep burgundy, navy blue. He looked better in darker tones and pastels. Um, guy with darker hair looks better with the true colors. Blues. Uh, he didn't look good in red. More winter, winter tones, jewel tones. Like you got a blank canvas with this man? Yeah, he said, dress me, I wanna, I wanna please you. So, yeah, <laughs> I dressed him. <laughs> it's like my new doll. <laughs> he said everything was stolen when he was in Iraq, so. Every day now, he was begging her to marry him. She resisted. She loved him, but she knew her kids would be furious. In early December, she was driving to Vegas on business, and he was tagging along. Why not drop by the courthouse while they were in town? He was quite excited. I was a little more nervous and kept saying, I can't wait to be married to you, and... Just, I'm so in love with you, and so on. I felt that this was an opportunity to love again. Deborah, will you take John to be your wedded husband to live together in bonds of marriage? There's a video of the ceremony. They're standing in a dreary room against a wall with a plant-covered trellis. It has the look of a spur-of-the-moment decision. John is wearing jeans and an untucked shirt, kind of sloppy. Deborah is in stylish slacks. He's beaming down at her. He chuckles a little as he tries to get the ring on her finger. Afterward, they celebrated with lemon drop martinis. They had known each other less than two months. No one had been invited to the wedding. She didn't tell anyone. It was all a secret. She kept it a secret as the weeks passed and Christmas approached. 
The family planned to have their traditional Christmas get-together at the home of Deborah's eldest daughter, Nicole. Jacqueline refused to go. Tara was torn. She desperately wanted to spend the holiday with her little nieces and nephews, but she didn't want to be around John. Here's Tara again. Me and my mom went to therapy to try to work things out and be able to have a Christmas together. And we worked out that John was not to be around the kids. So I just wanted to be involved in them. And then I got there hanging out for a while with them. And then he shows up with my mom. John was still just her boyfriend as far as anyone knew. He bustled in with his arms full of presents for the children. Dozens of presents Deborah had bought. He went up directly to the kids and started opening presents with them. And I felt very offended by that because that wasn't what we discussed. As Deborah remembers it, he didn't do anything wrong. He brought in the presents and sat by himself at the dining room table and the kids came up to him. Who could blame him for that? And he was good with kids. They brought out the playful side that she found so endearing. Everyone agrees what happened next. Tara began crying hysterically, making a scene. Tara, you just need to handle this. You don't have to hang out near him. Just, you know, go hang out in the other room. And she was fit to be tied. And she said, you promised that he wouldn't play with the kids. I go, what am I supposed to do? (laughs) He's sitting right there. (laughs) I go, it's sort of a tough situation. You just have to let it go. Tara's grandmother didn't understand why she was so upset. Here was Tara sitting in the family room by herself, just crying, her eyes out, just trembling and crying. Oh, she was hysterical. She would not, she said, I just want to leave. She said, and I was getting upset with her for doing that. I thought, you know, this is terrible. All of our family meeting for Christmas. And she was just sitting there shaking and just crying. Tara knew what people were thinking. There she goes again, being over-emotional. She was the youngest in the family. Her dad had left the house when she was young, and she'd been looked after by nannies during the years her mom built her business. She knew some people still thought of her as the little girl who needed attention. It was sometimes a fight to be taken seriously, and she would question the intensity of her own feelings. She always kind of got upset about things. And so I sat down and and talked to her about that. She said, I don't care. I don't like him. There's something about him I don't like him. In early 2015, Tara was back home in Vegas with Jimmy and their dogs. Tara wasn't talking to her mom. She just hoped John would go away. She wasn't like her sister Jacqueline back in Orange County, who had decided to take aggressive steps to make him go away. During the winter craze of planning for the holidays and balancing the rest of your life, cheese and crackers is a totally acceptable dinner, right? No, you deserve more. Step away from the box, put down the brie, Sunbasket is here to help. Sunbasket makes it easy to stick to your healthy habits and cook delicious meals at home. You pick from 12 weekly recipes, and they deliver organic and clean ingredients right to your door, pre-measured and easy to prep. This week was a hectic one for me. The job keeps me busy enough, but it's also my daughter's birthday this weekend, and no joke, even my mother-in-law is in town. Still, we sat down to home-cooked meals. Last night, we even had Korean rice cakes with ground pork and shiitake mushrooms. Delicious, and on the table from fresh ingredients in what, maybe half an hour? This holiday season, skip the grocery store and getting trapped in the parking lot madness. Discover how easy it is to get healthy, clean meals on the table with Sunbasket. Go to sunbasket.com slash dirtyjohn today to learn more and get $35 off your first order. That's sunbasket.com slash dirtyjohn for $35 off. sunbasket.com slash dirtyjohn. Jacqueline was angrier and more suspicious by the day. More than once, Mom would call and ask if she'd borrowed cash from her wallet. Money was missing. Jacqueline told her to keep a better eye on it. And I would be like, no, 
you know, I didn't go out of my way to your office or anything like that to go take or borrow money from you. How many places did you bring your purse today? Not only could it be that loser you're dating, but it could be anybody. <laughs> it's just she has a lot of little opportunities that people that you can't trust will take advantage of because she's so nice. She doesn't protect herself very well. She doesn't see the danger in a lot of situations. Other unsettling things were happening, like the texts Jacqueline would receive from her mom's number. And I knew that the replies were not coming from my mom. It wouldn't even be the way that she would type out her text message. He would misspell his words or he would use like slang. <laughs> and my mom, she's a pretty proper person when she's text messaging. You know, she uses capitals, periods and such. Like on Christmas, I was talking to my mom and she said, turning phone off, Merry Christmas. I was like, that's weird that my mom doesn't want to talk to me on Christmas. Jacqueline thought her mom had no idea who this man was. She decided to find out. I just had such a hatred and such a, a good intuition about John being an evil person that I felt like I needed more facts and more evidence because just me not liking him and thinking that he's a, an untrustworthy person isn't enough to tell my mom. It could look like, oh, people are just jealous that I'm happy, or it could be taken into so many different contexts. She started watching John's movements. John would leave the Balboa Island house in the morning in his medical scrubs, driving Deborah's Tesla, and come back in the afternoon. He said he wasn't affiliated with any particular hospital, that he traveled between clinics and ORs doing anesthesiology work as needed. So I asked my mom what he was doing all the time with her car, and she says, I don't know. I don't know where he goes during the day. He puts on his scrubs and he goes to work. And I said, are you sure? Do you wanna, would it be okay if I put a tracker on your car one day to find out where he's going. And she said, sure, put a tracker on my car if you want to put a tracker on my car. Deborah says she doesn't remember agreeing to this, but Jacqueline insists that she did. She showed me a picture she took when she attached the tracker. The photo's time stamped 11.34 p.m. on February 2nd, 2015. John had been in her mom's life about four months at this point. She says she bought two trackers online, actually, and put them in rotation. One would be on the car while she charged the other. She could monitor John's movements on her laptop or iPhone. She began studying the strange routes he took around Southern California, looking for patterns and clues. I just found that he would go to different doctor's offices and then he would go to a warehouse and he would usually go to a post office. It was usually fast food. He would always pull over and get shit food. And then he would go to the gas station. And then he would go to uh, a few, one or two doctor's offices, not in the area. They wouldn't be in Irvine. They would be sometimes Mission Viejo or one doctor's office looked like it was in uh, San Diego. And then the Tesla would come all the way back up the coast, sometimes like be at a charging portal. So I couldn't figure out what he was doing. I thought that maybe he was getting scripts for Oxycontin or like drugs that, um, and probably selling them on the street or maybe keeping them in a storage facility. So I couldn't figure out all of that, but I was definitely trying my hardest. None of it amounted to proof. None of it was necessarily incompatible with his story. These were fragments of a puzzle. Jacqueline knew she had to be careful about what she told her mom. It could get back to John. She didn't want to be dismissed as a meddler in her mom's business. Did you let anybody else know that you were tracking him? Did you tell him? Oh, I mean, my you, boyfriend, but he thought I was crazy. <laughs> he was like, you shouldn't get involved. This guy's scary. Like, it'll all pan out and your mom will find out. <laughs> But I was like, no, no, you don't know my mom. She's so sweet. She needs some help. There's something else you should know about the Newell family. 
a homicide more than three decades old that haunts the subtext of this story in ways large and small. In 1984, Deborah's older sister, Cindy, had been trying to escape a bad marriage. She told people her husband was controlling and possessive. One afternoon, he pressed a handgun against the back of her neck and killed her with a single bullet. It was the reason Deborah hated guns. It was the reason she refused to have a gun around long after people began warning her that she needed one. On the next episode of Dirty John. Um, oh, here it is right here. I have a picture. He had, see, $500 plus $475 plus $150 plus $3,414. Um, a SIG sewer. He, he was trying to get different gun parts and he was adding them up. Dirty John is reported and written by me, your host, Christopher Gofford, for the Los Angeles Times. Karen Lowe is our producer and editor. Audio design by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. Over the course of this production, our LA Times team has included Shelby Grad, Steve Clow, Robert Meeks, and Devon Maharaj. You can read the story at latimes.com. We're putting up installments as these episodes air. We'd also love to learn more about you. Please go to wondery.com forward slash survey. A listener note. This story contains adult content and language. In March 2015, Deborah Newell realized she had married a stranger, a man whose past was a series of fabrications. John had seemed desperately in love with her. She hadn't listened when her family told her his stories didn't add up. But now she had proof. Police reports, restraining orders from multiple women, jail and prison records. He was a serial con man, a master of intimidation. And according to the records, he had a nickname that went way back. Dirty John. Deborah hastily cleared her things out of the Balboa Island house they shared. She had to walk away from $50,000 she'd paid on the year-long lease. She began living out of hotels, hiding. John was stuck in the hospital after back surgery with an intestinal blockage. He began texting her accusations that she could not make sense of, that she had hit him, that she'd stolen $10,000 from his wallet. He threatened to call the police on her. He had become unrecognizable to her. He had seduced her with lavish, unending compliments about her beauty. Now he denigrated her looks, mocked her age, ridiculed her attempts to stay attractive at 59. Five marriages and a family that hates you. You want to see how this plays out? I sure do. You want to see how bad this turns out? You hit me. You threaten me, she replied. Enough. You're evil. He had come into the marriage with nothing. She ran a prosperous business. His motive was coming into focus. Divide up the stuff and I never see you again, he wrote. Your choice. He said people he knew in the mafia had contacted him. Long lost relatives. He warned her. Be careful here. Hi, it's Christopher Gofford. If you'd like to support more signature journalism like this, You can join us by subscribing to the L.A. Times. Our mission is to uncover the truth every day, and we invite you to be part of it at latimes.com slash join. That's latimes.com slash join. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is Dirty John. I'm Christopher Gofford. Part three, filthy. Well, the mob, the mob always had a presence in our home. My grandfather was a holder is basically what he was. 
was my dad explained to me is he held money. And I remember they would roll the $100 bills up and they'd shove them into the shower curtains. It was so funny. I was 12 years old at the time. I'm like, who puts money in the shower curtain rod? I'm talking to Donna Meehan Stewart, one of John Meehan's sisters. They grew up in San Jose, California, where their Brooklyn-raised dad ran the Diamond Wheel Casino. People came to play poker, low ball, and pan. The kids cleaned the floors and the ashtrays for money. Donna says that what John and his brother absorbed from his father and the men around him was a set of illicit skills, like how to file bogus lawsuits and pull off insurance scams. This is how you go about doing things dishonestly and cheating. And, you know, they, they taught those boys that. My, both my brothers were that way. They, they knew how to work systems. They knew how to lie. I'm trying to trace John Meehan's path from his childhood in San Jose to the day he lied and charmed his way into Deborah Newell's life. I'm trying to find out what he wanted to hide. Growing up with John was hell. Maybe it was just this sibling rivalry, but there was definitely issues with John. This is John Meehan's other sister, Karen Duvalet. She went to Prospect High School with him in Saratoga, California in the mid-1970s. He was very popular because of his sports, and he was very good-looking, so he was a chick magnet. Had a lot of women. He had... um, You know, a lot of charisma. He learned at a very young age how to work it. From as far back as I can remember, he was a straight-A student. I think John thought he was smarter than everybody else because everybody told him he was, but he had no common sense. He wasn't groomed to take that and be successful and to help other people and, you know, be grateful that, you know, you were blessed with these gifts. Instead, he was taught to manipulate at a very early age. And that's the fault of my parents especially my dad, because that's all my dad knew. She says the family was related to Albert Anastasia, the East Coast mobster who ran Murder, Inc. This is a name you know if you have even a passing interest in mafia history. Reporters called him the Mad Hatter and the Lord High Executioner, and he was famous for eliminating potential witnesses. He died in 1957, riddled with bullets in a New York City barber shop. You might have seen the photo. John and Karen's grandmother did have the surname Anastasi, but I couldn't find a conclusive genealogical link to the mob family. What matters is that John grew up with this as the family lore, and in the way others boast about forebears who are on the Mayflower, John bragged about this supposed mafia pedigree. You know, and if anybody did anything to John, or, you know, my dad would tell us, you go out there with a stick and take care of it. The Brooklyn mentality of you fight, you get even. Um, If you want to get back at somebody, you don't get back at them, you get back at their family. That's where that mafia mentality came in. John was really influenced by my dad. And that's what John locked on to, was the, the glamour of a mafia family. And it's just, you know, I look at it now and it's just still so weird. The sisters say their mother had an affair with a casino worker and their parents divorced. At the time, Karen was a high school freshman and John was a sophomore. And that's when, she says, John started to go really bad. It was a very bitter, it was a very angry divorce. You know, we were the all-American family, two boys and two girls, and literally one night I came home and it was gone. It was blown up. And he just hated my mom for destroying the family. And I think that is the beginning, you know, of John. You know, I think, you know, up until that point, he probably could have gotten some help if my parents would have stayed together long enough. But, you know, he got caught in the wheel of dysfunction. You know, my other brother was gone. My sister was married. And then there was me. So it was John and I that got kind of dumped. She says John hated his father, too. His father encouraged him to join the Air Force. She says the Air Force offered John a free ride through medical school, but he didn't want to give up the years of his life. So here he was, graduated high school, living here and there, working in hospitals as orderlies, you know, and um, wheeling and dealing, selling cocaine now. She says her brother was obsessed with the James Bond movies, Sean Connery's Bond. 
dressed suave and beyond the law with a license to kill. That was the image of himself John favored. He had a customized license plate that said M-E-E-007. He actually went to Santa Clara University for a while, but got in trouble all the time. It was just easier for John to just be 007 and to, you know, deal with women and money and, you know, cars and just hustle. He was a hustler. And whatever he had to do to get money, he would do. He was in the Taco Bell and he picked up a piece of glass and put it in a taco and uh, bit into it. The company that my dad worked for was the one who paid the claim. So I don't know if they were both in cahoots on that or what, but I know my dad was hurting for money back then. She tells me another story about a time John jumped in front of a Corvette and accused the driver of hitting him. It busted his leg pretty good, but, you know, my dad was behind that one and got John a grip of cash, a settlement. The sisters tell me that John got busted for drug dealing, that he testified against a friend in exchange for leniency, and that as part of the deal, he had to leave California. John got a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Arizona in 1988, and that fall, he enrolled in law school at the University of Dayton. I found a man named Kevin Horan, who happens to be an FBI agent now, but in the fall of 1988, they were law school classmates. I don't know if it was an air about him or the way he wore his clothes or the way he, you know, looked or whatever. He just kind of had a look of like, like a, like a California guy. I don't know. I don't know why that stuck out with me, but it did. But He says John didn't make a strong impression as a student. He made his name in other ways. I was living with some, some buddies right there on campus. Um, and they, they were the ones that really got to know him. And, and I think it pretty much coined the phrase, uh, that I, ca- I came to know uh, of him, and it called him Dirty John. And um, again, that had to do with, uh, I, I think, just him being kind of having a little reputation as a ladies' man or something like that. Along with Dirty John, they called him Filthy John. Sometimes they just called him Filthy. In the fall of 1989, Kevin moved into a house John was renovating out by the cemetery. Was he secretive uh, about his past? You know, either I never asked or he just never talked about it or whatever, but, it, you know, it, it, I guess it, it speaks volumes of the fact that I don't know anything about him. I hardly know anything at all about him. And, and here I live with him. I want to say it probably was that semester. I was noticing he was bringing girls back to the house. One of them was Tanya Sells, a pretty young nurse. She seemed so nice and innocent that Kevin had to wonder how John had won her. Here's an uh, intelligent, articulate, decent-looking guy at the University of Dayton Law School who, you know, seems to have his life together. This is Tanya, who now lives outside of Atlanta. He would tell you story after story about, you know, that he just comes from this family that's just not him. And, you know, that he, he, he was able to escape them because other people stepped up into his life and helped, you know, you know make him a great, great person. <laughs> The last semester of the second year of law school, John disappeared. Completely vanished. And uh, no one, I was talking to everybody, and, and everyone's like, what happened to Dirty John? And like everyone's like, I don't know, he just didn't come back. They got an answer when his report card arrived at the house. And I remember, you know, kind of peering, peering through, the, through the envelope, um, you know, the light peering through it that, you know, I remember seeing a bunch of Ds and Fs. And uh, so I knew, I mean, we knew that he was done, that he had basically uh, flunked out. Kevin says John's mail kept arriving at the house, boxes of CDs, credit cards, and fictitious names. It was clear that John had been running scams. Kevin says John also took money from an older woman for a roofing job he never completed. I found another law school classmate of John's, Lance Gildner, who says John seemed proud of the credit card swindle, not sheepish about it at all. Lance thought, this guy is committing felonies. So the name Dirty John, it started with his womanizing, but it seemed to grow and evolve and encompass a bunch of other things that he did, like these housing scams, right? It probably was a a conglomeration of many different things that people knew about him, that he was basically this, this, this strange lone wolf, guy that, you know, did all kinds of, you know, scandalous type things. And it wasn't just with women. 
I knew this stuff about Tanya that he was cheating on her. You know that you know that people called him you know filthy and dirty John, and he was ripping off little old ladies and stuff like that. John was still in the area, and his latest deception was at once more audacious and more intimate. He was getting married to the pretty nurse. It's November 10, 1990, at St. Joseph Catholic Church in Dayton, Ohio. John Meehan, failed law student, is about to marry Tanya Sells, who is about to graduate from anesthesia school. This is the bride's family church, where she was baptized and her dad was an altar boy. The officiating priest is her uncle. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for Tanya and John. The bride is 25. The groom is 31, though she thinks he's 26. He's told her he was born in 1964. She also thinks his name is Jonathan, although his name is just John. He's shaved five years off his age and added five letters to his name. Did it uh, strike you as strange that he didn't bring anybody to his wedding from his family? Okay, well, I, I mean, I can explain that. He would. He told me that you know, you know, his his dad was an alcoholic and his mom uh, was addicted to to painkillers, and that they were embarrassing, and that they didn't get along, and that the wedding day was about him, and he didn't want them ruining it. John fidgets and smirks in his tux through the ceremony. He looks like a boy in a grown-up's costume, enjoying some fantastic private joke. John wears that glib, devil-may-care expression as his friend Phil gives the toast. Um, y'all don't know John real well. <laughs> and um, I've known him for about three or four years now. And if you talk to any of his friends, you'll just, as far as the reaction to his wedding, you'll just find out that they're completely shocked and baffled. <laughs> and the reason why... <laughs> Bail yourself out. No, and the reason why, and I think one of the reasons John and I hit it off real well or started to become friends is uh, we're a little bit skeptical people, you know, to see John truly be in love is an inspiring thing for me. (laughs) And I'm sure for his friends too. And so, John, I wish you... The best of everything and may you live happily ever after. Thank you. Phil might be describing a guy he's just met for all we learn about him. I track down another of John's groomsmen and he tells me how strange the wedding felt. A Don Draper wedding, he calls it. A reference to the John Hamm character on Mad Men who is living under a fake name with a fabricated past. John, how do you feel this this, this evening? <laughs> Uh, I feel good. Thanks, Phil. And, Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the uh, toast. You did a damn good job, and I appreciate everybody being here, uh, except Lance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so uh, what do you got planned for the, the rest of the evening? The Re- rest of the evening, uh, drink, frivolity, fun, plundering pillages near and far. Sounds good. <laughs> We're spending really? our first friend job about two and a half years ago. Yeah, so, do you remember any particular anecdotes that, that happened that really come to mind? Any kind of anecdotes that come to mind? No. No. Well, we'll try somebody else. There's a blank space where the stories should be, and the stories his buddies do have aren't repeatable. Let me start by saying this John Behan's nickname is Filthy John Behan. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. why? It's, it's, why? It's, it's friends, why? Well, I remember when you first created that nickname. Why? Yeah. Yes, I do, but it cannot be divulged on camera. I don't. After the wedding, watching this video, Tanya is surprised to learn that this is the nickname of the man to whom she has just pledged her life. Tanya asks him about it, and he laughs it off. It's nothing. Ten years into the marriage, Tanya made a phone call he'd always forbidden. She, you know, clearly was shocked to be getting the phone call, but she also said in that phone call, I always knew you would call me. You know, I always knew that this would happen. Tanya is talking about how she tracked down John's mother, Dolores, in July 2000. Tanya had helped put John through nursing school at Wright State in Dayton and then through the Middle Tennessee School of Anesthesia, and they had two daughters. But now he was leaving her. 
He'd been working at Good Samaritan Hospital in Dayton and traveling between hospitals in nearby states. He was not a doctor, but a nurse with specialized training in anesthesiology, a nurse anesthetist. And he'd been having an affair with a doctor in Michigan, though Tanya didn't know the details at this point. So Tanya called his mom. She reads to me from her journal. I told her who I was and that John had left me asking me for a divorce. I told her that he had always forbidden me to talk to anyone in the family, but that now that I had nothing to lose, I wanted to know if she would talk to me and help me answer some questions that I had about John. She proceeded to tell me the following, and I just make like bullet points. John's real birthday is 2 3 So that's the day I get confirmation of that. His birth name is John Michael Meehan, not Jonathan Michael Meehan. He had gotten arrested in California uh, late 70s, I think it was actually early 80s, for uh, selling cocaine and turned in his best friend as a plea bargain. His mom asked me if he was still using drugs. <laughs> I was like, what? She called his sister Donna, who told her some of the same things, and his sister Karen. We talked for two hours. Um, in quotes, I wrote, we'll tell women anything to get them to like him. She said he was a genius, got straight A's. Tanya searched the house they shared in Springboro, Ohio, and found a hidden box containing the powerful surgical anesthetics Versed and fentanyl. As a nurse anesthetist herself, she knew there was no legitimate reason for him to bring these drugs home. At some point, he'd become hooked on the drugs he was supposed to be giving patients. She told police who started an investigation. This was September 2000. Depending on the state and the hospital you're in, when you go in for surgery, whether it's knee surgery or open-heart surgery, your life is often in the hands of the nurse anesthetist on duty. They put in the breathing tube, and they monitor your vital signs while you're under, and they control the amount of pain medication you're getting. An MD, that's the anesthesiologist, may or may not be supervising them. Anesthesia, if you're a good anesthetist, you've got some experience. We always say the job is 99% boredom because everything's going right. You're doing things right, everything's right, and 1% sheer terror because when things go bad, they go really bad. And if you don't have all your faculties, how are you going to handle something when it goes bad? How easy is it in that position, like John was, to steal the drugs? Extraordinarily easy. But here's the deal. Even though it's easy, anybody can do it. Um, once you start using, it's not so easy anymore because you need more and more and more and more, and you get sloppy and sloppy and sloppy. At worst, anesthetists who are stealing drugs and injecting them can miss something vital and kill a patient. More commonly, they leave a patient in excruciating pain. If it looks like the anesthetist gave the right amount of medicine and the patient wakes up and you know, hurting and in terrible pain and their blood pressure is high and their heart rate is high, and then, and then that's usually how the anesthetist starts getting looked at. Do they have a series of patients who are coming out that seem like they should be comfortable and they're not? I supported him while he went to nursing school. I supported him while he went to anesthesia school, and this is what he put a black mark on my, you know, my, my profession, but my profession. And I helped him get there. I had guilt about that. And so that, guilt about that, having him not hurt patients and protecting my children were my driving force for going to the police and, and um, doing what I did to, to make sure that he was stopped. John's career was unraveling. He lost his job at the Ohio and Michigan hospitals where he had been working and tried to start over in Warsaw, Indiana. Tanya's friends notified the nursing board there. And I don't know any of those details, but um, he was asked to, to get treatment. But he accused me of being the one to um, call the Indiana board to report him, which I had not. And uh, he was threatening me um, with these phone calls um, because he thought that I was, you know, ruining his life. <laughs> his career. Police told her to get the threats on tape. She plays them for me. Let me ask you a question. Can you answer me a question honestly? Yes, I'm the most honest person that you know. Who called the Indiana State Board of Nursing? Why am I going to tell you that? 
John, I'm not going to tell you who called. Why would I do that? You're the most vindictive person I know. I don't intend Any of the things you've done haven't hurt me, and you haven't done it purposely to hurt me. No. What, what were you doing it for? For kicks? No, to protect my children. No, that's, that's a whole different story. Listen, I, I spoke to my mom at great length. She's never going to talk to you again. I don't, John, that, why do you think that bothers me? Because we had a good long talk, John. And all this stuff you've been telling me, I've been a bunch of lies. The fact that me getting any half of your retirement isn't bothering you. you. You spoke to her at great length about how it bothered you. I think it's wrong. But if you can sleep taking it and you can you can live with that, then go ahead. That's what I've told you from the very beginning. Well, evidence. You know that it's wrong. Evidence. You know that it's wrong. No, it's not wrong. In your heart, you know that it's wrong. No, I know that. And that's why. And that's why, from the very beginning, you were going to let me keep it. Yeah, that's right. And you just done things the way I asked you to. But no, you wanted to cause all this trouble. I, I'm not trying to cause trouble. I'm trying to find out the truth so I can protect my children. Your family. The children are the last. Your family told, yeah. They are. Your family told me some very horrible things about the person that you really are. Call my mom now and let's see how honest and upfront these horrible things were. None of them were true. None of you. So your mom, your sisters, my mom they all said, told. Go ahead and call her now. Well, you know, if you threatened her and made her feel bad for telling me, then of you course you're going to change your. My mom, God. Amid the acrimony, they arranged for John to pick up the kids for a visitation. What compounds the awkwardness is that he's been living at Good Samaritan Hospital. I'll pick him up at 10 o'clock. Okay, I, but I have a question. Well, I mean, what about Abby's nap? Do you want to bring her back after a couple hours and then just go out with Em so that she can sleep? I mean, you're not going to have any place to lay her down. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk. Who, who am I picking her up from? My, my house. I don't work Sundays anymore. Okay, I'll pick him up at 10 o'clock. Okay, and, you know, don't forget, like, a diaper bag and stuff. I won't. Okay. All right. John's anger escalates, and so do his threats. Tanya plays me more calls. Well, why don't the hell you just get rid of my last name? I can't stand you using it. And one other thing, I have it on excellent, excellent authority. You're the one who's been making the phone calls. This is not. Sleep well. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Hello. What is your problem now? What is my problem? Why are you calling me and leaving me these messages? I don't care what your excellent authority is. I didn't make the phone call. I know who did. What, ma- what, what difference does it make? I this big smile on my face. <laughs> Why, John? Because trust me. Just, just trust me. Trust you what? Just trust me. It doesn't make any sense. I don't have to. You, you'll understand. It. Oh. What, the mafia's coming after me again, or what? <sighs> When it happens, Tanya, and you see it in your eye, you remember it was me, okay? Remember what, John? Keep that in mind. It was me. Keep what in mind, John? Tanya, you enjoy your time left on this earth, okay? Because that's what it's going to come down to. And uh, who's going to take I'm, care of your children? I'm wrong, and if I'm wrong, Tanya, I'll buy you a fucking Cadillac, okay? What do you mean if you're wrong? What does that mean? If I'm wrong, I'll buy you a Cadillac. If, well, if you're wrong about what? Keep that in mind. If you're wrong about what? You're not making any sense. Uh, Listen to me, Tanya. I'm listening. I got a big smile on my face. You know why? Because it's going to get done. What's going to get done? You don't make any sense. Well, it don't happen. You will understand when the time comes. Hmm. And that's all I got to say. Yeah, and who's going to take care of your children? I'll take care of them. Right. Because I'll be in front of you not having a big fucking Cobra Libra with a 22-year-old when it happens. That's you nice. that in mind. I swear to fucking God. If there's one thing that happens on this earth, it's going to be you. She thinks her crime, as he saw it, was in calling his mom. It was unforgivable to pierce the veil of his past. I mean, that's a big deal to John Meehan. He don't want people sharing information about him behind his back. Because that ruins everything. That ruins his stories. Because none of it's true. You know, none of what he says is true. I got to say, one thing that struck me about those recorded calls, though, was um, like he's making these threats to you. And at one point, you're like, uh, come, come pick up the kid uh, and don't forget the diapers like you're even 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 as you're even as you're terrified of this guy, you have to uh, you have to do the child handoff. 
Absolutely. Now, now, that's kind of that's kind of insane. Exactly. And if you don't turn your kids over, guess who goes to jail? You, not them. The reason for even bringing up those things at the end was he was living in his call room at Good Sam. He didn't have a house. He didn't have a place to visit with the children. He didn't have a place to put a child down for a nap. She says he never hurt her. She says he got a day of anger management classes for the threats. And that's it. And police couldn't seem to make a case on the drugs he'd taken. I didn't really know what he was necessarily capable of doing, but I was scared out of my skin. I don't know okay. if the whole thing made me nervous or it's just, you know, when you've, when you've been living a life for 12 years and, and one, one day or over the course of a few months, you find out that it's all been made up and, and wasn't true. I mean, it really rocks the core of who you are and what you believe is true and honest and, you know, good in the world. And that's, that's something that's hard to explain to someone who maybe has never, you know, had to experience that. You can be smart in the brain and not smart of the heart. <laughs> or not have, you know, a lot of life experiences or street smarts to, you know, come across. You know, even characters who are 10% of what John was. You know, people who lie to you or cheat you or steal from you. I had had a pretty easy, normal, you know, upbringing, childhood, and, and everything. And this was, this was my first experience with evil. Are you hiring? Find your dream candidate with these tips from ZipRecruiter and Dirty John. Tip. Use your job post to reflect your company's culture. Think about the type of candidate you're trying to attract and what they would respond to. For example, if it's a creative position, the job post can be written creatively. Once your job post is in good shape, then you can use ZipRecruiter to post to over 100 top job boards with one click. Their smart technology notifies qualified candidates to apply within minutes of posting. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Try ZipRecruiter for free by visiting ZipRecruiter.com slash Dirty John. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Dirty John. This has been a tip for finding your dream candidate from Dirty John and ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Well, the incident was reported to a police agency on September 25th, 2000, okay? And it was reported to the police agency when the wife had discovered the drugs. Dennis Lucan is a retired investigator on the drug task force of the Warren County Sheriff's Office in Ohio. Of all the criminals Lucan studied, hunted, and arrested during a four-decade career in law enforcement, John Meehan would come to occupy a singular place in his memory. He came to see him as a devil-tongued flim-flam artist with the cold intelligence of a spy, a void where his soul should have been, and a desperate drug addiction that he would marshal his dark talents to feed. Lucan took over the case in January 2002. He says he found emails showing John had sent drugs to his brother Daniel, who died of an overdose in Santa Cruz County in September 2000 at age 44. He couldn't make a case on that one, but he did manage to charge him with theft of surgical drugs. What about this case fascinates you so much to the point where you've paid attention to developments in this guy's life uh, long after your involvement in the uh, Ohio case ended? Well, the thing is, it was so intriguing at the time when I began conducting it, and as luck would have it, I got some breaks early on that I was able to uh, confront John and charge him with one count of theft, and and finding out about the emails to his brother where he was shipping drugs to him, just the most devious person I've ever met. And so we were able That's to charge a lot him. For, a for a career cop. Yeah, 
Uh, it is, you know, after four, after a total of 40 years, I can say he's the most devious, dangerous, deceptive person. And there are so many things that John has probably done that we will never, ever, ever know. It's just the fact that in talking with so many individuals, like I say, uh, telling him, telling me about him having a gun in the operating room, having him uh, withdraw Demerol, stoop down, and then come back up and never see it administered to a patient, as I read in one of the reports. Meehan pleaded guilty in 2002 to felony drug theft, and Lucan saw to it that he had his license yanked in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Michigan. Meehan did not show up for his sentencing. And in June, he was found at a Comfort Inn in Saginaw, Michigan. He was in a semi-conscious state surrounded by syringes and drug vials from another stolen anesthesia kit. They loaded him into the ambulance. En route to the hospital, he grabbed the drugs and jumped out of the ambulance. He ran into a J.C. Penney, climbed an elevator shaft, and scuffled with a cop who was trying to catch him. John spent 17 months in prison, and Lucan thought maybe the case was closed. But as the years passed, he would hear of a seemingly endless list of women he had scammed or was trying to scam. And so, at that point in time, I knew this, this case was going to go on until either somebody killed him or he killed somebody. When John got out of prison in 2004, his sister Donna tried hard to help him. She says he was ordered into a drug treatment program in Ohio. She covered his overdue child support. She got his car out of impound and his house out of foreclosure, landscaped it, got it move-in ready for him. This is on Lakewood Drive in Hamilton, Ohio. She gave him a credit card, too. His divorce was final, and he was going to learn to be a father again with supervised visitation of his kids. I mean, there was nothing he would have he would have had to do except to be a better person and go get help. And, and he had medical insurance and dental insurance. And uh, to take this time, and if you're really sorry for everything you did and you want to be a better person, you, there would have been no excuse. Money, nothing. She was heading to the door about to catch her flight home to California when she looked over her shoulder. I said, I'm leaving now. And his back was towards me and his laptop computer was open. And I saw Match.com. And I knew, oh my God, is this what we're going to do? Your first night home? Is this it? Match? Really? Ugh. What signal did that send you? Women. Women. What was important to him was getting a date right away. Women. How did you, you've been in prison on that. How do you know about Match.com? And and the reason I mention that is because that was his vehicle for picking all of his victims, these dating sites. John's neighbors told her they saw a parade of women coming through the house. He was racking up credit card debt and didn't seem to be looking for work. He moved to California, where Donna gave him a spare bedroom at her Newport Beach house and a job at a real estate business. So John needed to reenter the workforce. And he did that haphazardly. It was a disaster. He would never show up. I don't know what he was doing. He was going to the doctors all the time. He was going to hospitals. He says his back, I need to get my back fixed. My back hurts. And this is 2005 now. We had a difficult time with him because he was constantly seeking drugs. And I told him, I said, John, if you're doing this for drugs, I'm not going through this again. I can't. This is it. Donna found out that her insurance premiums had skyrocketed because of John's claims. In 2007, she decided to move to the Palm Springs area with her husband. He wasn't going to get better. He was going to do to me what he was doing to everybody else and just suck them dry. John followed her to the desert, and she says he stayed with her for about eight months. 
She says he rented a house and opened up shop doing RV repairs. I stopped helping him. He became pretty self-supportive, but I couldn't figure out where all the money was coming from. Wow, you're doing really good. Oh, my gosh. Well, he's stealing it. She says he bragged about pulling off a swindle with a Ford Explorer she gave him. He waited outside a bar and slammed on his brakes so a drunk would rear-end him. He collected a personal injury settlement, then filed a bar complaint against the lawyer who'd represented him to avoid paying his bill. Apart from dating sites, John met women at the hospitals he had checked himself into. Donna remembers an ER nurse calling her. She says, I, I need to talk to you. It's about your brother, and I'm sure you know about us, and we've been dating, and it was pretty serious, and I'm just so confused. I don't understand, and there's silence on my end, and she says to me, you have no idea who I am, do you? And I said, no. She got another call from a Riverside County woman who sued him for taking $50,000 of her money. I drove to the Riverside Courthouse. I pulled the case. I copied the complaint. I read it. I went over to his little office he had on Perez, and I remember I threw it at him. And I said, John, this is it. This is the end. You're off our medical. I don't want anything to do with you. And you got to give this girl her money back. No, no, you don't understand. It, it was a business deal. It was a business venture. And I said, nothing you do is a business venture. I was, I, I was hysterical. I was really upset. I was crying. I, I just felt crushed. I felt sick. Sick, sick, sick. Still, she allowed John to put his trailer on her RV lot in Cathedral City. But months went by and he refused to leave. He began waging a legal battle against his sister, the person who had tried hardest to help him. He claimed the lot was his. He complained to the DA. He wrote to the Department of Real Estate. He's trying to take what I had given him to use for his own benefit. I was crushed. My husband was crushed. He was pissed. So I thought, okay, all right, I'm a big girl. Uh, I'll fight as hard as I fought for you. I'm going to fight you. And I did. I got a restraining order. My daughter had to testify. I had a hearing. My aunt had to show up. John came straight out and uh, threatened to kill you? Yes, in an email to my daughter. She managed to get a court judgment against him for money she had lent him and he had promised to pay back. I knew I'd never see that money, but I did it to protect myself because John left me alone after that. It was never the money. It was leave me alone. It was all I had to me that was stronger than a gun. The best glimpse into how John Meehan perceived himself, the best account of how he framed a life littered with self-made disasters, might be in a letter he wrote in June 2012, asking a friend to help him get his nursing license back. In it, John cast himself as the brave, often betrayed, long-suffering victim in his life's twisted narrative. He was the victim of his parents, who used him as a pawn in their divorce and treated him coldly. Of his ex-wife, who called police on him and kept his daughters from him. Of his mother, who fed damaging information about him to his ex of false accusations that he supplied prescription drugs that killed his brother, of a herniated disc, which necessitated drugs to escape his pain and depression. To be honest with you, I was abusing this stuff not to get high or feel good, but because it allowed me to sleep, he wrote. My job, putting people to sleep. He explained that he checked into the Saginaw hotel room with the intention of killing himself, and he'd taken a shower with the aim of leaving, quote, a good-looking body. He injected himself with Versed and fentanyl, he said, but didn't get the fatal dose right. This is likely a lie. The man who put people to sleep for a living would have known the right dose. In state prison, his suffering continued. You don't even want to know what being in a Michigan prison is like, he wrote. One guy came at me thinking I was going to be easy. They found him in the shower the next morning. I did what I had to do. Several times. And they finally figured out I was not worth the effort of the trip to the ER. I learned fast, 
and always had that ability to turn it on when needed. The letter had the trappings of a confession, but at heart it was a long snarl of self-justification. It was stingy with insights into what created its author. Donna says John was bitterly preoccupied by the past. He once told her about visiting their hometown in 2012, the old neighborhoods, and the cemetery where their mother, who died a few years earlier, was buried. And I said, did you go to mom's grave? And he said, yes, I sure did. And I pissed on it, and it made me feel really good. And I said, John, that's sick. And he laughed. And I believe he did. So that's a pretty intense level of hatred that he had for her. He did. He did. But didn't he do that with every woman in his life? Basically. You know? I mean, if you look at the behavior, because I only know of the ones I know. I don't know the ones I don't know. She says John hated his father intensely, too. And that when their father was dying of cancer in Southern California in 1997 in a hospice bed, John came to visit. Donna says her dad had a little time left, and she'd been keeping watch by his bedside. But when John arrived and she left to take a shower, John was left alone with him briefly. And when she returned, her dad was dead. She has never been able to shake the feeling that John had something to do with it. Is there any way to prove that... um that he injected your father um, as he was dying with morphine or some kind of opioid that would have killed him? No. Like, is there any, is there, your father was cremated, so there's no way to know. No, and he took the ashes and he said that he spread them out over the bridge, but none of us ever knew. And so you literally just left your father's bedside for yes. five minutes. And John was yep. alone with him for five minutes, and that was it. Yep, yep. And my sister's the one that talked to the doctor. She called the oncologist. Someone gave him too much morphine or something. My brother wanted any money that was due him, and my dad's death was, his illness was taking any longer than it was supposed to be. Just be over it. I want to go. I don't want to be here. Yeah. Hated my dad. Back in Orange County, California, in March 2015, the woman who had been married to John Meehan for four months did not know all of this. Deborah Newell hadn't talked to John's law school classmates or his ex-wife or the Ohio cop, nor did she get the history of his life and crimes from his sister's. But she did have a stack of documents outlining a history of arrests and restraining orders and swindles, more than enough to scare her. His threatening texts amplified her fear. But as he lay at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach, his tone became conciliatory, repentant. He begged her to see him. He wanted to explain everything. I still love you and simply can't live without you. I don't want this. I want us without anyone else, John wrote. I am flawed, but I'm not so easy to give up on you. When I met you, it was simply you. I helped you to get back on your feet and stood up for you. I love you and need you. Please. On the next episode of Dirty John... He, he found me any way possible. He would text me. I'd block him from his cell phone. I blocked him from my aunt's cell phone. I blocked my aunt's cell phone. I blocked him from email. I blocked my aunt's email. I blocked Facebook. I got off Facebook. I got off Instagram. I got off every social media possible. He still found me. Dirty John is reported and written by me, your host, Christopher Gofford, for the Los Angeles Times. Karen Lowe is our producer and editor. Audio designed by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. During this production, our LA Times team has included Shelby Grad, Steve Clow, Robert Meeks, and Devon Maharaj. 
You can read the story at latimes.com. We're putting up installments as these episodes air. And check the website for photos of this story. We'd also love to learn more about you. Please go to wondery.com forward slash survey. A listener note. This story contains adult content and language. The private detective instructed Deborah Newell to take certain precautions. She should change hotels every few nights. She should study the crowd when she entered a room. She should look behind her to see if she was being followed. Find new places to eat. Change her routine. Sell her car. Get a dark wig to cover her conspicuous blonde hair. Ditch her stylish outfits for bland ones. Blend in. She had more than 300 pages of documents she'd taken from her husband John's home office, and during the frantic weeks of early 2015, she was pouring through them, trying to determine the scope of his criminal past. Every line deepened her fear. John was in the hospital, but she feared he might get out any day and come after her. So she followed the private eye's instructions on making herself a difficult target. But one suggestion she didn't follow... One thing she refused to do. That was to arm herself. She hated guns. 31 years earlier, her only sister had been killed by one. Hi, it's Christopher Gofford. If you'd like to support more signature journalism like this, you can join us by subscribing to the LA Times. Our mission is to uncover the truth every day, and we invite you to be part of it at latimes.com slash join. That's latimes.com slash join. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is Dirty John. I'm Christopher Gofford. Part four, forgiveness. Right off the bat, we knew this guy was a professional. I was scared for myself. I was scared for my aunt. I was scared for my family that once he got out of the hospital, that he was going to, you know, take some physical retaliation for us catching up on him. This is Deborah's nephew, Shad Vickers, who helped her hide. Shad studied John's record. To him, it had the look of a man who had managed again and again to avoid punishment for his crimes. You could see how case dismissed, case dismissed, case dismissed, case dismissed. Probably women just said, forget it, I don't want to deal with it. If I can just get it dismissed and if we're done, you know. We saw letters from men where he was having sexual conversation through emails with men that were in prison. He would say, you know, he was manipulating them. Uh, women while he was in prison, while he was out of prison. Uh, Just a lot of things that my aunt was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And, you know, once we went through all that, I knew she was never getting back together. There was a sickening repetitiveness to the stories about John Meehan. From 2005 to 2014, From about the time he got out of prison in Michigan for drug theft to the time he met Deborah Newell in California, he claimed victim after victim. The Laguna Beach police counted eight of them. Running through the stories was a streak of sadism and single-minded vindictiveness. They showed a man taking pleasure in the mechanics of a dark craft he had mastered. It seemed to go beyond just the money. He seemed obsessed with humiliating anyone who defied his will. To call him a con man would be too benign. He was that, but he was a lot more too. John would pick up women on dating websites. Often he used Match.com or Plenty of Fish. On dates he would wear medical scrubs and pretend to be a doctor. He would induce women to send him intimate photos of themselves, which he then used to blackmail them. He sent them to their families. He sent them to their kids' school. An Irvine woman told me that he cut and pasted her photo from Match.com and sent flyers to her neighbors calling her a slut and a homewrecker. 
A judge gave her a five-year restraining order, and he retaliated by asking for a restraining order on her. A Porter Ranch woman told police he wrote her an anonymous letter insinuating that he had raped her while she was unconscious and had taken photos of it. You are my project for years to come, he wrote. This I promise. Do you think I joke? Every breath I take will be to ruin your surgically implanted life. Thanks for the pictures. By the spring of 2013, two women had long-term restraining orders already in place against John Meehan. That was when still another woman approached police. This was a 48-year-old aspiring writer from Laguna Beach. She told a strange and chilling story. The writer said she'd been recovering from brain surgery at a San Diego hospital when she awoke to find John standing over her bed. He said he was her anesthesiologist. He was handsome and friendly and gave her his number. Soon they were dating. He told her he loved her. She told him that her family had millions. He told her to transfer her money into his account to hide it from her estranged husband. When she balked, he sent nude photos of her to her family and claimed she had been stealing from him. You're in way over your head on this one, he wrote, demanding the money. Make it happen and I walk away. If not, I will be your nightmare. He went to prison for stalking the writer and being a felon in possession of a firearm. The more Shad learned about his record, the more he felt there was good reason to fear John. Yes, but I also knew that my aunt was leaving him. I was finally happy, you know, that she was going to be safe and we'd figure out how to, you know, if I knew that I was already prepared that if I saw him, I'd call 911 if, you know, uh, anything happened, I was ready to call the police. So, my aunt was leaving him. That's all that mattered. So we thought. <laughs> so we thought. Even as she was trying to process the information about who she'd married, even as she was trying to guard against him, Deborah Newell also felt herself being pulled in another direction. John was sending her text after text, pleading with her. Her lawyer instructed her to change her will. Because he feels that this man is going to kill me because of the money to get whatever he could. And so they wanted to show him the will and show him that um, he is not the beneficiary, but my kids are. In the meantime, 23 days go by, and he's been stuck in the hospital with his back. He's had a bowel obstruction. I think he's also loving all the drugs because he was addicted to painkillers. So 23 days go by, and I just want to look him straight in the face and ask him why he did this. So I went in there, and he said that those stories are wrong, that he was set up. He was trying to tell me so many times uh, that he was set up and had to go uh, to jail. Please forgive him. He just knew that I wouldn't understand until he had all the evidence in front of him. and All a big misunderstanding. All a big misunderstanding, and he had an answer for everything and it was so convincing that I thought okay um, so he literally had convinced me at this point that he is not this person despite all the paperwork despite yeah the, despite the yes background. all the facts were right there in front of me and he is that convincing that I would say that I went, I was also in love with him. So it's so hard when you're in love to listen, you know, you're listening to your heart, not your head. Did he beg you to take him back? Oh, yes. What um, sort of things did he say? He can't live without me. Um, he's so in love with me. This is different than anything he's ever gone through. Um, that he was set up and he'll prove it. He had an explanation for the cruel, menacing texts he'd sent her. That was the drugs the hospital put him on. That wasn't him. 
He had an explanation for why police had once found cable ties and cyanide in his belongings. His explanation, um, cable ties, he said he works on cars. Okay, but with the cyanide, he said that he had MS and that he was going to take his life one day when it got too bad. I thought, okay, hmm. Cyanide is not a, a good death, from what I understand. But you didn't know that until... But I didn't know that. So I was on the fence with him, but he was doing everything he could to win me back, to prove that these weren't true stories, so on and so forth. Did you ask about his uh, nickname, Dirty John? He said it wasn't true. He said, oh, I don't know where you got that from. It was as if everything, he was able to convince me. He was so good at it. It could be a, a cold day out and he could convince me that it's 95 degrees. That's how good he was. To where you questioned yourself, hmm. So it's almost like he convinced you that all the facts about his life were some kind of hallucination on your part. Yes, yes. He made me out to be the one that he was this great guy and that everyone else had done him wrong, is what he had said. The restraining orders, how did he explain those? He told me some of them weren't him. He said, I, you know, that's not my middle name, or if you pull up my name, there's lots of John Meehan's out there. Um, and he said, so that's not a restraining order on me. She found a newspaper story about John's arrest for stealing surgical drugs when he worked as a nurse anesthetist in the Midwest. He had an explanation for that, too. He said that he was always in a hurry and took them home with him because he had to hurry up and get home to his kids. And when he was going through his divorce with his wife, that was her way of framing him so he couldn't get the kids. So he always, again, he always had a story. He told me that he'd lie because he thought he'd lose me. Um, that he feels so lucky that I'm such a forgiving person, and how I'm, I'm the love of his life, that I've made him a better person, you know, just all this kind of stuff. He also backed up a lot of the lies by stating he twisted them. Because I said, well, I read this. Well, that's not what happened. Oh, my gosh, you know. And he'd have this whole elaborate story about what happened, opposed to what I read. There had been another chilling twist to the Laguna Beach case. As John awaited trial in the Orange County Jail in late 2013, an inmate reported that John was offering money for the murders of two Laguna Beach detectives, plus five other potential witnesses against him, including several ex-girlfriends and his ex-wife. John's price? $10,000 a body. John's philosophy? With no witnesses, there is no trial. The threat felt real enough that detectives requested still another restraining order against him. And one wrote, I regard him as a ticking bomb, capable of unpredictable violence. And I fear respondent will violently lash out and physically harm me. But the jail informant refused to be a witness no charges were filed for murder solicitation, and the restraining order was denied. What did he say about the, uh, the contract hit that he tried to take out on the cops? He started laughing. He said, he goes, they're going to believe some thug in prison over, you know. He says, oh, they're just making this up. He goes, I never, he goes, where would I get 10000 from at that point? Um... This is after the $900,000 that he said he had in a trust. <laughs> so at this point, I'm thinking, well, okay. What about uh, not being a doctor? He said that he um, was like an anesthesiologist. And I said, well, why would you do that? He goes, to make myself look better. And I said, but John, he goes, well, look at you. You're this high-powered, you know, businesswoman and 
And I remember his sister told me later on that John always wanted to be something great. He even told them he was a doctor and they found out he wasn't a doctor. So he always elaborated and made up these stories. I think he, uh, unfortunately, that's who he was early on in life. So as he's telling this lie, he kind of makes it a point to flatter you. Like, you're so much better than me. Yeah. Yeah. And did he ever say he had a drug problem? No, never. Never. Never caught on to that. Thought there were a lot of pills around, but I knew with his bad back and I didn't think. I remember the first time I was with him, I thought, wow, there's a lot of pills. But then once I realized he had a really bad back, he has screws and uh, if you, I don't know if you, he has so many scars on him. Um, so I thought, well, I, I guess he needs pain pills. I don't know. And if he's only taking one a day, so, and if he has MS, I guess he has to take something for that. So I didn't really educate myself on what everything exactly was. I feel guilty to some degree that I've married him and that he's in the hospital. But at the same time, I feared... Explain that to me. Guilty. Guilty why? Because I made a commitment. I made a commitment to marriage, better for worse. But at the same time, I'm looking at this man and I have to think about my myself and my safety. And my kids' safety, for that matter. She did something that would astonish and horrify her family. She withdrew her request to annul the marriage. She took him back. She didn't tell her family at first. She knew they'd be furious. She didn't tell people at her office, but she began sneaking away to see him. And she began quietly looking for another place with him. Their house on Balboa Island was full of bad memories, and the plan was to start fresh. They found an apartment near the Irvine Spectrum. It took two months to move into another place together. So we moved in. There was a caution with me. I kept trying to figure out what were lies, what was the truth. The issue was, is he treated me so well. It was as if I was the only thing on earth. I listened carefully to Deborah's explanation for why she went back to him. But no matter how many ways I asked, no matter how many ways she tried to explain, it remained baffling. This was a woman who ran a prosperous interior design firm with 30 employees, a savvy entrepreneur who traveled around the world and saw her work celebrated in the newspapers. Was this an extreme example of the compartmentalized nature of intelligence? an illustration of how he can be sharp in one area and easily misled in another. I thought of conversations I'd had with some of the other women John had deceived, women of intelligence and achievement, a PR professional, a gynecologist, and John's ex-wife, Tanya, a nurse anesthetist who told me it wasn't about how smart you were in the brain. She said, the heart is a different organ. But in Deborah's case, I kept thinking there had to be more to it. I kept going back to what had happened to Deborah's older sister, Cindy, in 1984, and of what had happened to her killer, and what it said about Deborah's family. Are you hiring? Find your dream candidate with these tips from ZipRecruiter and Dirty John. Tip. Did you know that 70% of job listings use masculine language, but listings that use gender-neutral wording get about 40% more responses overall? Use gender-neutral wording in your job post to avoid limiting the talent that's attracted to your business. Then, you can use ZipRecruiter to post your job to over 100 top job boards with one click. 
Their smart technology notifies qualified candidates to apply within minutes of posting. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Try ZipRecruiter for free by visiting ZipRecruiter.com slash DirtyJohn. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash DirtyJohn. This has been a tip for finding your dream candidate from Dirty John and ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. I have spoken all over the United States and even out of the United States because people love to hear, I think, about forgiveness. This is Arlene Hart, mother of Cindy and Deborah Newell. Cindy was our firstborn, darling young lady. She turned into a beautiful young lady, and she married a wonderful young man named Billy. Um, But one night she came home from her graduation and flopped on our bed and showed, lifted up her left hand and said, look what I got tonight. And I said, is that a little friendship ring, you know? She said, no, Mom, it's an engagement ring. I said, oh, dear. She was only 17 at the time. I said, honey, I said, when are you planning to get married? She said, on my 18th birthday. I said, oh, no, Cindy really had a mind of her own. (laughs) She was very stubborn. Billy Vickers managed a supermarket. He and Cindy had two boys. But when they were married, I think it was 14 years, 13 or 14 years, Cindy came to me and she said, Mom, I'm not happily married. You were right. I should have waited longer. She said, he's not the type of person I want to be married to. And I said, what? What? You know, because I thought they got along pretty well. He was fun to be with. And she said, he's very, very possessive. He he won't even let me wear a bikini at the beach. And I said, oh, really? I didn't even know that. And all this time, we were having great times with him, you know, at picnics and and over at our house at Christmas time and Thanksgiving. And and we just had a great family unit. And she named several things that I didn't even know what was happening. She said, I can't even go out in the evening, go shopping or anything, because he's afraid a guy will pick me up or something. And uh, I can understand maybe why he was that way, because she couldn't even step out the door with the guys looking at her and uh, gawking at her. She was, uh, you know, just a, a beauty, just a beauty. And she said, but Mom, she said, he is so possessive. I can't do anything. One day, a professional football player met Cindy in Palm Springs and got her phone number. She was flattered by the attention. Arlene says he would send his limo by to pick her up. The marriage foundered. So they decided, she said, Mom, we're going to get a divorce. And I said, oh, honey, I said, that's terrible. And she said, no, she said, I can't stand living with Billy anymore. And she told me all the things she didn't like about Billy. And I loved Billy. I was, um, and so anyway, they separated at that time, and Billy came and lived with us, um, with Shad, the older boy. He was 11. And Cindy stayed in the house with, with the younger boy, Shane. She says Billy was determined not to lose her. He was crying. He said, I don't, uh, Cindy wants me to divorce. He wants to get a divorce, and I don't want a divorce. I love her so much. I can't let her go. I can't. So Cindy called me up. She said, Mom, we're go- I'm going to be at the house tomorrow, and I want to talk with you. We have not been able to talk, and I want to talk to you and tell you the things that are happening. I said, oh, I'd love to have you. She said, I'll come over for lunch. I said, great, I'll fix your special lunch for you. Billy Vickers had taken a friend's gun. It was a chrome-plated 25 caliber pistol with a black plastic handle. He met his wife at their house in Garden Grove in Southern California. They were selling the place, and there were details to settle. He walked up behind her as she sat at a table writing out checks. So I was teaching piano at the time, like I've done all my life. <laughs> Every half hour, another student would come in. It was a beautiful day. And I thought, oh, I get to see Cindy today. We'll have lunch together. It's going to be great. I was really excited. Right about noon, I got up and went in and fixed lunch because she said that she'd be there at 12. But 12 came and she didn't come. 12.30, 1 o'clock. So I put everything back in the refrigerator and continued my day of of teaching. (laughs) 
four, four o'clock, the doorbell rang, and I went to the door. There were two policemen standing there. The one on the left said, there's been a shooting. And I thought, oh, no, he's so disturbed over losing Cindy that he shot himself. I said, who's been, who's been shot? He said, your daughter has been shot. I said, my daughter? I couldn't believe that. And I said, oh, how bad is she? Not expecting this at all. And he said, she's dead. And I looked at him and the other police and just broke in and said, and Billy shot himself too. And I said, is he dead too? No, he's not dead. And I said, oh, no. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I could not believe what I was hearing. The two policemen just stood there with their hats on their chest. And, and I just, right at that time, I just thought, you know what? I need to pray. I really need to pray. And I asked them, I said, can I just pray? They said, of course you can. So I stood there, and I lifted my hands toward heaven. And I just said, God, you've got to help me. I cannot do this alone. You've got to help me, God. Help me, God. I'd been a Christian since I was a little girl. I knew God personally. And all of a sudden, I felt a sense of peace come over me. And it drifted down all through my body. And I breathed a deep breath. And I looked at the policeman. I said, I'm going to be okay. They took me inside and we sat. I had to lie down on the floor because a lot of our furniture was out. Our couch was out being covered. I was lying there on the floor and the two policemen were just kneeling down right beside me. And they were so kind to me. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to be okay because I feel God's presence with me. And he's told me in his word that whatever we go through, he's going through it with me. And he was. He went right through that. Her grandson, Shad, who was 11 years old, was in another room. She had to tell him what had happened. Shad was in there watching uh, TV. And I, I took him out of the room. I said, something terrible has happened, Shad. She had said, what, Grandma? He said, why are the policemen here? I said, they came to tell me that your daddy has shot and killed your mother. And he goes, no, no. I said, that's right. And he's all, he, also, he also shot himself, but he's not dead. And he said, oh. And you know what? He looked up. He looked up maybe right then and he said, you know, Abraham Lincoln didn't have a mother. And I said, yes. That's right. You're right, Chad. Look what he turned out to be. He said, I know. And he said, I can get through this too, like you, Grandma. But you know what? I still loved Billy. And everyone cannot believe it that I loved Billy. I didn't love him for what he did. I, you know, I hated what he did. But I still loved Billy. And I forgave him. He called the house. And he did regain his faculties after about six weeks in the hospital. And he called, and he, and he wanted to talk to all of us. And so we all got around the phone. And he, he just kept saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I said, Billy, we know that you're sorry, but we still love you. And he said, how could you love me? How could you? And I said... God has given that love to us for you. We love you and we forgive you. And he just sobbed and he cried. I went to the courthouse in Santa Ana to dig up what's left of the official record of the case. It's been 33 years and most of the file is long since destroyed, including the exhibits. But I found a transcript of the preliminary hearing on April 26, 1984, in the case of People v. Billy Franklin Vickers. Vickers was charged with murder in the first degree. A witness named Carol Planchin, one of Vickers' friends, testifies that Billy came to her house to borrow her husband's gun about two weeks before the shooting. Vickers said he wanted to take it to the shooting range and that her husband had said it was okay. She gave it to him and joked, Don't hold up a liquor store. 
Planchin's husband, Bill, testifies that he never gave Vickers permission to take the gun. He says he worried Vickers would harm himself. He called Vickers repeatedly and asked to have it back, and Vickers replied, I don't have it anymore, I got rid of it. An emergency dispatcher testifies that at 3.08 p.m. on March 8, 1984, a man calls and says, I shot myself. A paramedic says that he stepped into the house and found Cindy Vickers slumped in a chair, with her husband bleeding from his self-inflicted wound on the kitchen floor. A medical examiner testifies that Cindy Ruth Vickers died of a single gunshot wound to the back of the neck. The black powder around the hole showed the gun had been in direct contact with the skin. I found the defense attorney who represented Bill Vickers. His name is James Riddett. He knew the facts were bad for his client, who was looking at the possibility of life in prison. Riddett told me that he was sitting in his office one day when he received a phone call that astonished him. It was Arlene, the victim's mother. She was offering to aid in the defense of her daughter's killer. She didn't believe he could have done it if he'd been in his right mind. I was on the witness stand for five hours, and he kept saying, you and the prosecuting the district uh, attorney. lawyer, attorney, yeah, kept saying, yeah. you mean that you like Billy? I said, I not only like Billy, I love Billy. I knew him before. I know him now. I hated what he did, hated, absolutely, he killed our daughter, but I still love Billy. And, and that guy just shook his head and stomped out. And he said, I cannot believe what you're saying. The whole jury had tears in their eyes. They were crying. I talked to the former prosecutor she is referring to, Thomas Avdif, who took the case to trial in January 1985. He says it looked to him like a cold-blooded execution, but that wasn't what made it singular in his experience. It was the victim's family. He says Cindy Vickers' family threw her away. As he interpreted it, the gist of the mother's testimony and that of other family members whose names he doesn't recall was that Cindy had mistreated her husband. And he says he has no doubt that testimony influenced the result. They threw her under the bus, he tells me. I don't know the dynamics of the family. I could never understand that. Why say bad things about the victim? The defense attorney put on psychologists to make the case that Vickers hadn't been in his right mind, that he'd been in a state of temporary unconsciousness. This seemed to sway the jurors as well. During deliberations, they sent a note asking to be read the legal definition of consciousness versus unconsciousness. The jury found Vickers not guilty of murder, but it couldn't agree to the lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter. The judge declared a mistrial on February 1st, 1985. Avdiv says he planned to retry the case when Vickers agreed to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter. Billy Vickers wrote on the plea form, on March 8, 1984, in the county of Orange, I shot and killed my wife, Cindy Vickers. In exchange, he got a five-year sentence. Arlene credits her own testimony for Billy's short prison term. He got credit for time served, credit for good behavior, and he was out before Christmas 1986. The consequence of forgiveness was this. Bill Franklin Vickers spent two years, nine months, and nine days in lockup for shooting his wife in the head. Deborah disagrees with the prosecutor's interpretation of her mom's testimony. Deborah says her parents taught her to see the good in people, always. They made it a point to take in troubled kids and give them another chance. They believed that none of God's children was irredeemable, and enough love could work wonders. Billy Vickers remarried and returned to Orange County, not far from where he did the shooting. He's still in the area. I tried to get him to talk to me, but he didn't return my messages. For years, Deborah would see him in the bleachers at her nephew's football games and at family functions, and people were careful not to bring up Cindy. One of her nephews had a birthday party a few years back, and there was Billy, and she had to leave. Now and then she'd run into him at the church she attended, Mariners. She'd say hello, she'd try to be polite, but she didn't want to be around him. 
Deborah says that forgiving him brought her mother peace, but that she was never able to do it herself. You were raised, though, in a, in a culture of uh, extreme forgiveness. Oh, yes. Like, I've never, I've never seen... I've covered a lot of criminal cases, mm-hmm. and I, I don't think I've seen a lot of cases where the mother testifies on behalf of the guy who's killed the daughter. The way I view it is my parents were raised and their whole life was being a Christ-like Christian. And then their roles in the church being the example, I think that that was the only way that they knew how to be. I went to a psychologist over it because I wasn't quite having that instant forgiveness. And I was talking to the psychologist, and he said, what's happening is they're on cloud nine, and they have this forgiveness, they believe all this. You're trying to be down here and deal with life. And the realization of what's happened isn't as easy for you to accept and forgive. I guess what I'm trying to understand is, did. Did uh, your feeling that people need to be forgiven, because that's the Christian thing to do, Mm -hmm. did that play into your decision to take John back? I don't know. I, I think that I fell in love and was willing to believe what he was telling me. Wanted to believe what he was telling me, I guess. I'll never understand it, why, but I always do see the great and I think everyone. I I have to be frank with you, this is the part of the story that's hardest to explain. I bet. Why would we go back? Yeah. So when you took him back and he moved into the spectrum with Uh you, did he seem repentant? Like, oh, extremely. He was going to church with me. He would cry in church. <laughs> um, he literally did just about anything that I wanted to do. Went to a, this Christian concert with me, went, um, asked me for forgiveness. We started going to free chapel, but we started going there and he really liked it. He would like weep in church during the sermon? Yeah. And what did you make of that? Well, of course I thought, oh, that's wonderful. (laughs) Um, You thought he was feeling God and feeling repentance? Yeah. Were there certain messages that induced tears? A Father's Day one. Um, he cried on Father's Day. That was a hard day for him. Said he missed his kids every single day. And he thinks about them every single day. This was part of John's master narrative of his life in which he was the perpetual victim. His ex-wife, who'd found surgical drugs in their home and called police, had wronged him. His ex-wife had deprived him of his daughters. John was back from the hospital, 20 pounds lighter. He was lifting weights, chugging protein shakes, frustrated at the slow pace of rebuilding his big frame. He would keep falling sick and need to go to the ER. Maybe to get drugs, Deborah thought. Tara Newell told me that when her mom took her to lunch that summer, the summer of 2015, mom seemed distracted, preoccupied by her smartphone. Someone kept texting her, and Tara had a strong suspicion who it was. Are you still seeing him, she asked. Yes. They had been living together again since June. Deborah's family was furious when they found out that she'd gone back. They were in disbelief. Even her mother had trouble understanding. I didn't have anything to do with him because it was just wrecking the family. It totally, totally wrecked the family for many months. The family was just torn apart. We didn't get together because of that. 
and it was just and everyone was talking about it why is Debbie staying with this guy I kept praying God I don't want to lose another daughter <laughs> not another one you know and I just said God um, help I, I didn't know how to pray I just whatever God needed to do I just wanted that man out of our lives I, I was nervous the whole time the whole time. Because of John's presence in her life, Deborah's children were pulling away from her, in some cases not letting her see her grandkids. Shad, the 11-year-old boy who lost his mother to his father's bullet, was now in his early 40s and estranged from the aunt he had long treasured as a second mother. For months and months and months and months, we wouldn't talk to her. Nobody. And we, I thought about that every day, about him killing my aunt. I, I was very, you know... I was protecting myself. I was staying. And as long as I wasn't talking to my aunt, I wasn't getting, I wasn't getting text, texts or emails from John. So as long as I completely disconnected, if, but if I ever had any type of conversation with her, unfortunately she would tell him and then he would be, re- he, he found me any way possible. He would text me. I block him from his cell phone. I blocked him from my aunt's cell phone. I blocked my aunt's cell phone. I blocked him from email. I blocked my aunt's email. I blocked Facebook. I got off Facebook. I got off Instagram. I got off every social media possible. He still found me. He still got other phones, you know, if I did have any contact with my aunt. But then when I said, okay, Debbie, I am done. No more. If you're going to continue with this guy, you'll never have any contact with me or my kids. And then it, it was better. Deborah says the estrangement from her kids and grandkids was breaking her heart. John told her he needed her. He had multiple sclerosis after all. She wouldn't abandon him to his illness, would she? It sounds like he knew exactly what part of you to appeal to. Oh, always, yeah. Yeah, he had a way of convincing me. I don't know if I truly believed him or just wanted to believe him. And again, halfway in the marriage, I realized that he's not going to be that easy to leave. On the next episode of Dirty John. I couldn't tell you what color his eyes were. But I can tell you that as I sat across that table from him that day, they were as black as coal. It's the kind of thing where you look at somebody and you swear, you swear you can hear, you can literally hear the seething cauldron that's inside their brain. And that's when I started looking at this guy thinking, oh my God, he is a nutcase. This is a dangerous man. Our next episode will be available in two days. In the meantime, if you like what you heard, do tell your friends about our show. It's available at latimes.com, wondery.com, and every major podcast player, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Dirty John is reported and written by me, your host, Christopher Gofford, for the Los Angeles Times. Karen Lowe is our producer and editor. Audio design by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. Over the course of this production, our LA Times team has included Shelby Grad, Steve Clow, Robert Meeks, and Devon Maharaj. You can read the story at latimes.com. We're putting up installments as these episodes air. A listener note. This story contains adult content and language. John Jallo can't be sure how John Meehan found him, and he was apprehensive about taking him on as a client. His paralegal had done some research on Meehan and was so spooked that she told her boss she wanted no part of the case. Meehan had done prison time for stalking and terrorizing a Laguna Beach woman, and now on April 8, 2015, Meehan was sitting in Jallo's Santa Ana law office. Meehan wanted Jallo to sue the Laguna Beach woman, claiming she'd cheated him of a quarter million dollars. 
Meehan had other ideas for lawsuits, too. There was yet another woman who had supposedly cheated him. He also accused police who had arrested him of stealing his cash. The blizzard of lawsuits was part of John Meehan's plan to win back the trust of his wife, Deborah, who was sitting beside him. He wanted Jallo to prove he'd been the victim in case after case, not at all the dangerous swindler portrayed in mountains of court papers. Jallo told me that he planned to turn down the case, even though he would be getting a $25,000 retainer. But meeting Deborah, listening to Deborah, gave him second thoughts. She seemed naive and helplessly in her husband's grip. She struck me right off the bat as a very genuine, very sweet, very vulnerable lady. And she was obviously in love with him. Um, although I, I really only met him face-to-face once, and that was in about a two-hour interview, um, he was the scariest man I had ever met in my life. I'm 70 years old. I practiced law for 42 years before I retired last year in September. John Meehan was scary. Hi, it's Christopher Gofford. If you'd like to support more signature journalism like this, you can join us by subscribing to the LA Times. Our mission is to uncover the truth every day, and we invite you to be part of it at latimes.com slash join. That's latimes.com slash join. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is Dirty John. I'm Christopher Gofford. Part five, escape. So I've got this lady that, that's sitting there who just strikes me as wonderful woman and this scary, scary guy that I just, I can hardly look at him sometimes because it, it just feels to me like the anger that he is holding inside is, is, is so intense. Deborah explained that her family didn't trust the man she'd married after a whirlwind romance of less than two months. There was a definite chill in her relationship with her children. They believed he was a greedy predator and that the longer they stayed married, the bigger his claim on her considerable wealth. She was asking me, what can we do? Can you do anything that will help put my family at ease? I asked her whether or not she had gotten a prenuptial agreement with John before they got married. And she said that she had not. And I suggested that, well, maybe it would ease your family's mind if we did a postnup. Jallo began explaining how a postnup would work. It would effectively cut John out of Deborah's fortune if they split up. The strangest thing happened during the course of this two hours together. The more we dealt about the postnup and how it would actually go in effect, the more sulking and angry John became. Not vis- not not um, vocally. He what he didn't get angry with me. He didn't say anything like we don't need your goddamn stinking postnup thing like that. But as we talked about it. He was like sinking down in his chair with his hands crossed in front of his chest. And he was almost scowling at me with, this, with, his, with his lips puckered and his squinty glaze. I couldn't tell you what color his eyes were. But I can tell you that as I sat across that table from him that day, they were as black as coal. It's the kind of thing where you look at somebody and you swear... You swear you can hear, you can literally hear the seething cauldron that's inside their brain. And that's when I started looking at this guy thinking, oh my God, he is a nutcase. This is a dangerous man. And at one point I looked at him and said, you know, John, it's obvious that you don't like this conversation uh, 
about you know where we're going with all of this. But John, it's obvious to me that this woman loves you and she's looking for a way to eliminate this problem that we have with her family. So I'm not here to try and hurt you. I'm not here to act as the bad guy. I'm here because this woman is in love with you and is asking for my help to try and smooth things over with her family. John's responses became shorter, more clipped. But still, he didn't yell at him or threaten him. This was someone I wanted to get out of the room with. I just felt like, you know, this guy, you like his, his forehead's going to break open right in front of me because there is so much anger. Even, you know, I, I would tell you, beyond anger, you, I just got the feeling that this guy was consumed with rage. He was very good at keeping it bottled up, but it was something that was palpable to me. Nothing that would result in a complaint to the police department that would ever stick though. You can't file you can't file a charge on a guy for that. Certainly not, and the woman he was married to wasn't asking me to do anything about that. Two things occurred to me. The first was I just got stronger in my feeling that this woman needs some protection. And if she's got nobody else, then this office is going to try and do it as much as we can. The other thing that occurred to me as I looked at John and I watched him seething about the idea that there would be a post-nuptial agreement was that this guy is going to find a way to torch this deal now. He's going to find a way to say, no, oh, no, you're fired. Uh, you're, you're, you're not doing this right. You're fired. After they left his office, Jallo says he told his assistant that he thought Deborah's life was in danger, that someone needed to protect her. This lady, I don't want to be melodramatic, but this lady, is her life is in peril. If she says or does the wrong thing for him, I just believe this guy's got killer instincts in him. Jallo got to work on the post-nup. He sent financial disclosure papers to John to fill out, but John dragged his feet in returning them. Jallo also told him he'd studied the material he'd given him on the woman he claimed had defrauded him, including a big stack of emails, and couldn't see the makings of a lawsuit. He needed a lot more information. He went ballistic on the phone, and he started screaming and yelling, you should have had that lawsuit filed by now. You should have had both of those lawsuits filed by now. I don't think you know what you're doing. You're just a waste of my time. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. You're fired. And I said, okay, all right. John, if that's the way you feel, I think I should talk to uh, Deborah uh, to see does that apply on the post up. He said, you are fired. You don't work for me. You don't work for Deborah. You don't, we want nothing to do with you. Jallo would put some time into the case, and he said he'd figure out what to bill him and return the remainder of the money. She said, no, the fuck you won't. You are going to send me every goddamn dollar back, that type of thing. And he starts screaming at me that I'm a fraud, that I'm a crook. Uh, I mean, he is just getting nasty beyond belief. I'm going, I, I'm calling, I have a check here for $25,000 tomorrow morning, or I call the Bar Association. And... So I thought to myself, there ain't no way I'm giving this guy 25 grand back. I am going to figure out my time, and I am going to bill it, and I am going to give him uh, the remainder back. And I don't care whether he goes to the Bar Association or not. I mean, I've got a retainer from him. I've got, I can show all my work. I can show all those emails. But then he, we've got emails going back and forth between him and me at that point where he is just losing it. He is... He wants his money. I, it's got to be paid right now. Um, uh, he's going to go to the state's attorney's, district attorney's office, blah, blah, blah. And me, I'm thinking of, wow, this is the guy that I'm pretty sure has, has, has homicide in his, in his head, you know? It was around this time that Jallo started bringing a shotgun to work. I've got bills to pay, I've got uh, the lights to keep on, I've got the rent to pay, I've got employees to pay, but I'm thinking, you know, this is one guy I don't want to have out there thinking, you know, screaming and yelling that I cheated him. This is a guy who would do anything. 
So I agree to give him his money back. I should add that later, a couple of weeks later, he filed a complaint with the bar. Even after he cashed the check? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jala wasn't able to get through John to reach Deborah, and he wanted to know her position on all this. All he could think to do is drive to her business in Irvine, Ambrosia Interior Design, and leave her a note. I said, I'd like to leave this for Miss Newell. This is a personal matter, if you'd please deliver it. And all I said was, Deborah, I don't know if you know this or not, but John has filed a complaint with the Bar Association. I am just curious as to whether or not you're aware of it and whether or not you concur with it. That's all I asked. I didn't get a call from her. I got a call from him. Don't you, if you ever, ever contact my wife again, and that, this may, may be the one time where he did threaten me. You know, he just, if you, you ever contact my wife again, you are going to regret it. You know, so I figured, oh, you know, that was a dumb thing. Now I pissed this guy off even more. What's interesting is that it took you only two hours to form an impression that's lasted now years. It's almost like the opposite of a religious experience, you know, where you meet someone holy and it changes, changes your life. This is sort of the inverse of that. Like you looked into a void. That, that is so true because we all, we don't want to believe the really bad things about people. We just don't. Uh, we want to think that people are good. And when you meet somebody like this and you realize I am sitting here in the presence of evil incarnate, you know that people like him really do exist. And one has just come into your orbit. Scariest man I've met in my 70 years. Deborah made sure John understood that one day her children would inherit all her money. That was fine, John told her. All he needed was her. He used to tell me that he would rather that he could date so many wealthier women than me, that he would much rather be with me with no money living under a bridge than with the wealthiest woman living in a mansion without love. Deborah had cut John out of her will months back for fear that he might kill her. And though she went to sleep beside him and woke up beside him, it was impossible to completely banish that fear. Find your dream candidate with these tips from ZipRecruiter and Dirty John. Tip, make sure your job post reflects the position honestly. It should clearly spell out the responsibilities of the position, the type of company culture you're striving to create, and what opportunities for growth the position offers. Then, you can use ZipRecruiter to post your job to over 100 top job boards with one click. Their smart technology notifies qualified candidates to apply within minutes of posting. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Try ZipRecruiter for free by visiting ZipRecruiter.com slash Dirty John. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Dirty John. This has been a tip for finding your dream candidate from Dirty John and ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Deborah's kids thought it was flat out crazy that she had returned to John. And Meehan wanted her kids, particularly her two oldest daughters, out of her life. He blamed them for the troubles in the marriage, blamed them for hiring a private eye to probe his past, blamed them for temporarily turning his wife against him. This is Jacqueline. I was very angry that she had gotten back together with him because I just felt like of all of the evidence that we had, how could you believe, you know, how could anything, how could any story prove that this stuff is okay to be here? Um all of this evidence about John. John's hatred for Deborah's family did not seem to extend to Tara, Deborah's youngest and quietest daughter, even though she had clashed with him. He found her the least troublesome of his stepdaughters. Tara feared him and disliked him. He was the reason she sometimes carried a pocket knife. She said she was willing to sit down with him and try to work things out, believing he would never take her up on it. Jacqueline was upset with Tara for seeming to give him a chance. Tara's a lot more like my mom, where she wants to believe the best in people, 
rather than see any of the bad things. And um, I could probably be a little bit more like them. <laughs> it would do me some good, but uh, I just couldn't see anything good in him, just all bad. In the summer of 2015, Tara was living in Vegas with her boyfriend, Jimmy Grob. They were renting a three-bedroom house with three dogs and two cats and trying to make it work. Every love affair has its own set of rituals, and theirs was a Sunday night television show. So something that Tara and I bonded over definitely was uh, an affinity for one of our favorite shows, The Walking Dead. And, uh, you know, it's the way the show is set up, they put these characters in such crazy, you know, dire uh, circumstances. One episode, uh, I think it was in the second season, where uh, a character is trapped in... uh, in a bathroom of an RV and, uh, you know, is just basically death is knocking at the door right there. Uh, it's relentless and won't stop. It's, you know, menacing. And then she gets handed a screwdriver from one of her mates up top and, uh, ends up, you know, just stabbing the thing to death in the, in the face. And, it was just, you know, that fight or flight moment. And it's like, what are you going to do when something that menacing just won't stop? We would watch that show, then we would watch it again, and then we would watch The Talking Dead. I just thought, if there's a zombie apocalypse, then maybe I might know what to do. <laughs> a zombie is an uncomplicated dream of evil. Almost everything else in the world is ambiguous. There's good and bad people and bad and good people and gray everywhere. But zombies are not reasonable and they're not redeemable. They're only survivable or destroyable. As the shadow of John's menace seemed to lengthen, this was the feeling evoked in people who had come to fear him. Tara says she got a zombie kit for Jimmy with food, water, a flashlight, a filter straw, matches, a thermal blanket, and knives. I told him to take it just in case he ever had zombies in his life. <laughs> and where did you get all this stuff? Um, I went to, there's a zombie apocalypse store in Vegas. The zombie kit was her Christmas present to Jimmy in 2014, and it was their last Christmas together. By the summer of 2015, they were breaking up. In the breakup, Tara got Cash, their Australian shepherd. She had a tighter bond with Cash than Jimmy did. Deborah drove out to Vegas to pick up her daughter, who was crestfallen after the breakup. John didn't object. Tara moved back to California and started applying for jobs. She found one as a kennel attendant and dog groomer. She loved the company of animals. John and Deborah were living in a luxury apartment near the Irvine Spectrum, an upscale area. They traveled a lot, Denver and Colorado Springs, San Francisco and Seattle, Santa Barbara and Lake Tahoe. He was back to his doting ways. He spent the day, many days, uh, getting my cars washed, running errands for me, going to the post office, helping me with different things, getting my dry cleaning, going grocery shopping. He'd have flowers all the time for me. He wanted to hold me all night and kiss me constantly and things like that. So there was this, I mean, obviously it feels good. So you, um, you hold on to that, I think at times. At night he fell asleep holding her, breathing against the side of her neck, his arm over her body. It was strange to be in love with someone and fear him at the same time. She was careful what she told him about her kids because he became so volatile at any mention of them. He was secretive about the rare phone calls he'd get. He claimed to spend a lot of time at 24-hour fitness or at the sauna, but she really had no idea what he did all day. When they went to the dog park to let the golden retriever Murphy run around, who was this woman who kept smiling at him? Had they shared something together? Sometimes she'd come home afraid she'd find something she didn't want to see, like John with another woman or doing drugs. I was a little nervous going home. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what he was doing on his computer all day. I didn't know what he was doing. I was scared. 
I think that I was scared for my life and my kid's life. I'd made a, such a major mistake. And so what happens? Do you tell anybody? Like, hey, I need to get out of this? I didn't want anyone to worry. So I kept it to myself. I did call psychologists a few times and talk to them. What did they say? They said you need to protect yourself. Um, so it's best not to just jump out of it uh, real quickly, but to plan it. Deborah would have to play the role of the happy wife for now. Sometimes he seemed to sense that something had changed. He said, you don't look at me in the same way. He said, I know you're going to leave me. She told him it was just his imagination, that she was busy at work, that she was stressed, that she was sorry, and she made him one of his favorite meals, pork roast with vegetables, jambalaya, chicken noodle soup from scratch. He'd say he wouldn't know what to do without her, that he wanted to die in her arms. Sometimes they had the semblance of a normal domestic life. In the evening, he'd put on the TV while she sat reading beside him. He liked the show Lock Up, the documentary series about life behind bars, and Intervention, the show about addiction, two subjects about which he had intimate experience. He liked the comic Daniel Tosh on Comedy Central. But his favorite show was MTV's Ridiculousness, which mocks people in viral videos who do stupid things and get hurt. It always made John laugh. Deborah had begun hiding money from him. She'd take $2,000 from every paycheck and give it to her eldest daughter or to a friend. She didn't want him to have access to all her money for fear he'd take it. And she didn't want him to know that she was still giving money to her kids. In October 2015, she bought a house on North Water Street in Henderson, Nevada, It was an investment, and she got to work upgrading it. But more importantly, it was a place John could stay where he would be away from her children. One day she went to see Jacqueline, and when she returned, he confronted her about where she'd been. He'd kept a tracker on her car. He told her if she saw Jacqueline again, he'd throw Jacqueline in the ocean and make sure she didn't come out. I'd say, oh, you know, stop being so dramatic, or things like that. There were just comments like about his wife, ex-wife, about Jacqueline, about, I started realizing this man, if I do try to leave him, and I think that part of me wanted them to finally all like each other and be a happy family, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't happening. By December 2015, they'd been married a year. John sat down to type her a two-page letter. It was a treacly bonbon with a core of arsenic. It reminded her of what he required. Between her family and her husband, there was room only for him. It starts out saying, Deb, happy anniversary, one year, and forever means forever. He would say that to me all the time. We've been through some hard times, complicated times, but at the end of the day, I have you to myself. No family, no issues that we can't work out. I love you. You have the kindest, most forgiving heart of any person I've ever known. I want to grow old with you. I want to hear your breath in the middle of the night. Feel you reach for me when there is nothing else between us. I can't imagine living without you and your absolutely nutty family. They're not nutty, by the way. Um, I hope to get over what they did. I wish I could now, because I see the pain you have being away from them. I wish I could just fix this. I wish I could make all those problems and issues go away. But sometimes life is so complicated that there is no turning around. Sometimes the issue is bigger than us. Sometimes letting go is better than holding on. We have each other. We have each other forever. I will never cheat or disrespect you in any way. I have no desire for anything other than you. 
You are simply the best person I have ever known with the biggest heart imaginable. I wish I was more like you. I wish I could see the world like you do. He went on to say, I love the way you smell and the way you drift off to La La Land while I'm talking to you. I love the feel of you, and needless to say, making love to you is about as close to a religious experience as I have ever had. I hope I die in your arms, because this world would be a dark place without you. I hope you love me, and we grow old together. I hope. He told her these sort of things all the time, and they always sounded sincere. And I felt very torn. Um, Here's my family, and here I go again another failure. So I didn't think I wanted, I could go through another divorce. I thought, how can I keep getting this so wrong so many times? Um, I know my problem is I jump into them without really getting to know the person. She knew she would never really be able to trust him. She knew she'd been deceiving herself, that her children had not been her enemies, but the ones who'd seen him clearly from the start. In February 2016, John discovered that Deborah had been secretly giving Jacqueline money to attend real estate classes. He thought that I was out of my mom's life, and the fact that my mom and I were talking a little bit really bothered him because he wanted me just out of the picture, away. Of all the people in the family, you were the one he most identified as an enemy, right? Yes. John and I really had it out for each other. John started sending Jacqueline lewd messages. He called her real estate school and slandered her, embarrassing her to the point that she dropped out. She says he sent her a picture of her birth certificate with spit on it. She sent some heated messages back. She showed me their exchanges from March 6, 2016. I googled pile of shit, and then I sent him an image of a pile of shit. (laughs) And then... um, I was like, if you had a life, you wouldn't be wasting your energy emailing me. Let's just stop wasting each other's time. Nobody cares about you. He was like, you don't have a mom. And it's like, she's right next to me and we're reading your emails together. She reads me a couple more from John. Mommy wants nothing to do with you and that will kill you. Jumping off a tall building would make me smile. Head first will work. I said, leave me alone, you sick pervert. (laughs) Yeah, jump head first. Your mom and I will be laughing. I thought, what a sick thing to say to my daughter. It was just the things he would say that, at that point, who can be with someone like that? But I really had to protect myself and my kids. Deborah had been married to John a year and three months at this point. She withdrew $120,000 from her bank account, hoping he wouldn't notice. She gave some money to a friend to hold and some to a daughter. She had $30,000 stashed in the bottom drawer in a closet, banded stacks of $100 bills. Somehow he found it. He confronted her at their Orange County apartment. He put it in front of me and said, what's this? So I said, money? And he went into my accounts and said, why are you withdrawing all this money? He had been tracking all my accounts. And when he plopped that stack of cash in front of you, what did you say? Uh, it's mine. It's mine before you. Just don't want you to have it. And he says, no, everything that is yours is mine. And I said, no, anything that was mine before you is still mine. And that's when he said, and he, we were getting heated up. And I'm not one to even raise my voice, if you know who I am. He said, hit me, hit me. Because if you hit me, I'll make sure you never get up again. He said, I'm not going to hit you. And I packed a bag and I left. And I said, I want a divorce. I'm out of here. So that was the end of the end. I think I grabbed one shoe, some of my makeup, and left. You mean one pair of shoes? No, one shoe. I'm taking stuff and I'm leaving. Deborah and Jacqueline drove out to the house in Henderson, Nevada, when they knew John was in California. They worried he might be monitoring them on security cameras he'd installed at the house, so they had no time to lose. 
He could make it there in four hours if he knew. Deborah put tape over the camera lenses. They brought professional movers and they worked quickly, packing up Deborah's stuff, stacking it into the big truck. It was March 29, 2016. Jacqueline used her iPhone to record the condition of the house as they prepared to leave, just in case John complained that they damaged or stolen his things. I got everything. Let's go. Yeah. I even want a video of you leaving. Let's get. You got your keys? You got your phone? I just have like a video looking back. You can see the truck and the guys moving stuff. And then her driving home. Yeah, it got really ugly really fast, which I knew it would. Gigolo is the perfect term for this guy. He had nothing, nothing, and portrayed himself as having everything. Deborah had approached a family law attorney who spoke to John Meehan by phone and heard something chilling in his voice. He cared about his clients, he said, but he had a family. He decided to pass on the case. Then she found Michael R. O'Neill, who had more than four decades in the law and kept a shotgun at his Santa Ana office. He sized up the situation fast. He saw how John, a disgraced and penniless nurse anesthetist, had lured her in, then managed to keep her even after he'd been unmasked the first time. You take the victim away, the con man's nothing. He has to eat. He's got to, like, like a shark, he's got to eat. And that's what he is. He is a shark. And he looks for his prey. He, they select these people. You know, they don't, they don't just nilly willy bump into somebody and go, wow, you'd be a great victim. They know exactly about their victim. And she finally realized then once she saw all the bad stuff that, hey, look, let's get away from this guy. And then he became a bad con man. He took away the polish and the spelt shark stuff and he became a big fat sea bass. You know, she's very religious. And when you humble yourself, you the shark, and you say, I can't believe that all these years I've been this shark. I now would like to be a salmon or a trout. And I owe it all to you. Well, that is more the chameleon of the guy. wonder how far you can take this fish metaphor. Oh, yeah. Right? I guess I like will. <laughs> but, but that's what he's done. He's just, you have to find somebody that will swallow that line hook, line, and sinker. So when I ask about the uh, the specific nature of the con that, uh, that John would run, by that I mean his goal was to get into people's lives, marry them, and then take half their stuff, right? Was no, that... to take all their stuff. He didn't want half. And he believed he was, in, after all, he was entitled to it. He was entitled to it. She filed for divorce in April 2016. If Deborah had glimpsed a frightening side of him during their first separation, now he seemed a creature of pure malignancy. He wrote, You get your family. I got the dog. I got the better deal. He wanted money and promised to bleed her dry through the divorce courts if she fought him. He wrote, For once in your holier-than-thou life, listen to me. You are going to have to pay both sides, which could easily take a year. We had a good run except for your family. There is no trust, but the last thing I want to do is break you. He sent her photos of himself with a provocatively posed ex-girlfriend. He threatened to disseminate compromising photos and emails. He wrote, Make yourself available or I ruin a family. There are children involved, Deb. This is bigger than you. No more being nice. This will turn an entire family inside out. You're selfish to allow this. You'll never forgive yourself, but I am doing it. He lectured her. You don't know how to live. Sex is not love. Get help. He denounced her as a crook on Yelp. He had once coaxed naked photos out of her, and now he sent them to her family. He texted her that he knew where she was when she picked up her grandkid. And he sent a horrible text to one of her nephews, whose mother, Cindy, Deborah's sister, had been shot to death in 1984 by her husband. 
It was a wound that John delighted in inflaming. John wrote, Your dad should have put one in the back of your useless head as well as your brother just after he blew your mom's brains out all over the wall. Deborah says he forged her name on $17,000 worth of checks. And he accused her of assaulting him. Deb, I saw this coming. It's pathetic it's come to this point, but you leave me with no options after your storm of lies. She replied, Storm of lies, wow. You are the expert in that area. He had brought only three boxes with him to the marriage, mostly old clothes. Now he wanted $7,000 a month in spousal support and $75,000 in attorney's fees. He accused her of stealing $90,000 in cash from him and $30,000 in gold coins. He complained that he was living on monthly disability checks of $558 for his bad back. John wrote, It doesn't matter that paying support isn't what a real man demands. It's what the court feels is equitable. That's all that matters. Think, Deb. There is no alternative to this unless you start thinking. That, or you will eventually get bled dry. Be smart, Deb. You have no idea of the mistakes you made. Be smart and you'll save a fortune. I don't trust anything you say, Deborah wrote. You're evil. She understood now how he worked. He turned everything around. He made his victims look like his tormentors. He told her she was a pathological liar. Face it, Deb, I'm smarter than you. She replied, stop. Don't contact me again or I will go to the police. He had posed as her soulmate, the answer to her longings after four failed marriages, and now he used her past as a barb. You think I'm going to allow your family to continue? Look in the mirror five times and still making the same mistakes. Now you're getting yours. Pray, Deb. Pray hard. He had turned himself into a church-going Christian and wept during sermons, knowing God mattered to her, and now he used her faith as a cudgel. Everyone is a better Christian than you, he wrote. Paybacks are costly and a bitch. He had rhapsodized endlessly about her beauty and promised she would never know loneliness again. And now he wrote, You lying old bag, you'll grow old alone. He sent her a list of her clients, builders who used her interior design business, and threatened to call them twice a day. Deborah brought her lawyer a stack of legal papers documenting his criminal history and his emails. She wanted a restraining order. She feared for her life. She wanted protection for herself, for her 36-year-old daughter, Nicole, her 26-year-old daughter, Jacqueline, and her 38-year-old son, Brandon. She did not list Tara, who was 24, on the request. John seemed not to be a threat to her. I mean, I submitted an inch worth of uh, documentation. I worked day and night for like two or three days, both with Deborah and without Deborah, to put together the entire package. O'Neill cited more than a decade's accumulation of mayhem. The theft of hospital drugs. The Indiana Board of Nursing calling him, quote, a clear and immediate danger to the public, end quote. The time he jumped from a moving ambulance to avoid arrest. The restraining order requests from women who feared he would kill them. The detectives, so worried by John's reported death threats that they too asked for a restraining order. The arrest for extortion and stalking. But all of that wasn't enough. In order to get a domestic violence restraining order in the judicial system and family law, you have to show a couple of things. Number one, that it's an emergency. Number two, that you are in fear of your life, safety, whatever, immediately, and that the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator, has the ability and the means to do what it is you're alleging he's going to do, which puts you in fear and apprehension. What the court said is, no, we can't do that because he hasn't laid hands on you. He hasn't hurt you physically. Plus, John lived in Henderson in another state, and there wasn't what the court thought of as fresh blood. O'Neill was surprised, but understood the court's reasoning. In retrospect, it would have been nothing more than a piece of paper. 
And that piece of paper wouldn't have slowed down Meehan at all. John had never been violent to Deborah before. O'Neill thought his threats were probably idle. He hoped. I had, hadn't seen anything where he had made any overt gestures to, you know, get hands on her. I, I just thought, this is a sick puppy. I mean, that was my position all along. You're just a sick son of a bitch, you know, and that's what I thought. The judge told them they could come back in 14 days to apply for a permanent restraining order. Deborah did something inadvertently to sabotage it. She says another lawyer told her she would save on legal fees if she could get John to settle. Would he accept a certain dollar amount to agree to an annulment? She misunderstood that as a suggestion to meet him, and she went to the Henderson house. She thought he looked like he'd aged a decade since she last saw him, and his weight was way down. She broached the subject of the annulment. She even said they might try to start fresh afterward with no lies. It was the only thing she could think of to say. He wouldn't hear of it. She'd promised till death do us part. He wept and said he was dying of cancer. He didn't want to die alone. How could she leave him? He told her he'd do anything to make it right. She wrote him a $10,000 check to fix the Henderson house and told him he could stay there while they figured things out. She was trying to keep him occupied and buy some time. She says she slept on a mattress on the floor that night. I'm dying, Deb, slowly dying. Please just come up with something so we can move on. He texted her when she got back to California. I'm not doing well, Deb. I'm doing horrible without you. I need you. Because she had seen John, because she had actually spent the night at the Henderson house, her lawyer knew no judge would grant the restraining order. How scared could she be if she saw him voluntarily? I said, what were you thinking? You have completely taken away every muscle, every hammer, every degree of strength that we have to get a, a restraining order. You have completely vitiated that 100%. So we have no chance. It was June 2016. Deborah was living out of hotels, working out of hotels, checking in under the names of her assistants, wearing a dark wig to conceal her blonde hair. Now and then she snuck into her office in Irvine. Around 1 p.m. on Saturday, June 11th, she got there to find her blue sport model 2015 Jaguar XF was missing from the lot, a $64,000 car. Two days later, the car was discovered in front of a business a block away. It reeked of gas, and there was fire damage to the seat and doors, and there was a gas can in the car. Whoever had attempted to torch her car had done an inept job. The windows were rolled up, and the doors were closed. The fire had extinguished itself for lack of oxygen. Grainy surveillance footage showed John and jeans crouched behind the bushes, watching the car, waiting that Saturday morning and it showed him come back about an hour later wearing gloves and a painter's uniform. Police talked to John, who admitted that he had taken the car that Saturday, but insisted that he had done so with Deborah's permission and had then returned it unharmed. This was not a full admission of guilt, but a stupid thing to say. It put a man who lived out of state at the scene. Well, once he came down and set the, the Jaguar on fire and stole the Jaguar, it sort of changed the, the playing field a little bit. Well, now, now he's reaching out. Hey, and I kept talking to Irvine PD. Are you going to do anything? I mean, we have a video. We know he did it. You have the video. Do something about it. O'Neill thought if police could connect him to the Jaguar torching, he could finally get the restraining order. Everybody kept assuring me, yeah, we're investigating. Yeah, we're looking into it. Yeah, we think we got the right guy. All of June passed, and then all of July, and still the police had not arrested him. They said they were building a case, trying to nail him with inconsistencies in his story. O'Neill's name and business address was on all the court papers. He says two of his friends, who were family law attorneys, were murdered by people on the opposing side. He thought it was a good time to put in extra locks at his Santa Ana office. I just thought he was the boogeyman. I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean to say that, that I was intimidated or I was scared. I'm not going to be a shotgun that sits over there underneath my, my 
cabinet. But but still, it doesn't do you any good if it's over there under the cabinet if somebody barges into your, your office and you're sitting over at your desk. He was a bad man from the onset. He was a bad man. Whether or not he would take it to the extreme that he ultimately took it to, I would have never thought that until at least the car incident and the torching. And then he became a hands-on. Deborah blocked his texts and emails, and this seemed to enrage him. Deborah changed phones. She refused to hire a guard. She thought she would be okay since she was on the road a lot living out of hotels. When she was in Orange County, she stayed with Jacqueline, who had found a new apartment near the John Wayne Airport. It had a security gate, but Jacqueline worried about John following her into the parking garage. After the car torching, he seemed capable of anything. I felt like I needed uh, some protection as far as the weapon. Because what am I going to do when some 6'2 guy comes at me? I'm 5'2". I'm whole fit. You know, I'm 95 pounds. Jacqueline says she got herself a Smith & Wesson revolver. Of all John's stepkids, she knew he hated her the most. On the final episode of Dirty John. Police, do you have an emergency? Yeah, we do. We got, um... Come on. Breathe. Come on. Breathe. It's really sad. All right, I understand. We have officers on the way. Like, Mommy, somebody's screaming. Somebody's screaming. And then she saw this guy just raising his hand up and down, 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 up and down. Dirty John is reported and written by me, your host, Christopher Gofford, for the Los Angeles Times. Karen Lowe is our producer and editor. Audio design by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. Over the course of this production, our LA Times team has included Shelby Grad, Steve Clow, Robert Meeks, and Devon Maharaj. You can read the story at latimes.com. We're putting up installments as these episodes air. I was recently interviewed by Real Crime Profile, a podcast hosted by Laura Richards, Lisa Zambetti, and Jim Clementi, a retired FBI profiler. But they had some interesting theories about John, his M.O., and a little-known form of psychological abuse called coercive control. You can listen to Real Crime Profile wherever you get your podcasts. A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. John Michael Meehan may or may not have had some connection to organized crime. Whether to intimidate people or to impress them with his dark glamour, he bragged frequently about his underworld ties. He claimed to trace his bloodline to the prolific East Coast hitman who ran Murder, Inc. itself. He lied about everything, so who really knew? What unnerved people, once they got in his bad side, is how he talked about the mob's way of doing things, with a touch of real admiration in his voice. Like the mob's tactic of getting back at enemies, they didn't go after the enemies themselves. A dead enemy couldn't suffer after all. You went after the loved ones. You went after their families. Jacqueline Newell was living with her mother, Deborah, at the Carlisle Apartments in Irvine near the airport. They were afraid of Deborah's estranged husband, John. They kept waiting for police to charge him with lighting Deborah's car on fire, but two months had passed and there had been no arrest, no restraining order. Deborah had cut John off from her money. She wasn't taking his calls or texts. She and her kids were looking after John's golden retriever, Murphy, which he'd left at a pound, and Deborah had the Buick Enclave he'd been using, which had been impounded after he ran it into a gate. John had been staying in Henderson, Nevada, but nobody knew for sure when he might appear here in Irvine. Jacqueline felt he was watching them. He didn't have a car, he didn't have his dog, and he was just spiraling out of control. He was just, he didn't really have much to live for. He didn't have anything to live for. Around 11.30 on the night of Friday, August 19, 2016, Jacqueline was returning from dinner with a friend. They were pulling up to the front of the complex when she saw John in a car, in the dark, waiting. 
I could see his face from the reflection of his cell phone. And instantly when I pulled in, we saw each other. We locked eyes and he ducked his head. And I said, that's him, that's him. And the driver didn't know what I was talking about for a moment. Um, and I said, follow him. John's headlights were off and he sped past the light when he realized that we were behind him. He went straight and made a right-hand turn onto the freeway. John had smashed or removed the lights on his rental car as if to improve his ability to move furtively in the dark. Jacqueline thinks John was there to kill her or her mom, that he had been hoping to catch one of them alone, an easy target, and the presence of her male friend scared John off. But now Jacqueline feared he would go after her younger sister, Tara, who lived a few miles away in Newport Beach. I knew that it was, this was game time. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is Dirty John. I'm Christopher Gofford. Part 6. Tara. Jacqueline told her friend to drive to the Coronados, the sprawling apartment complex in next-door Newport Beach where Tara was living. Here's Jacqueline. I'd much prefer him to come back to my house because then we could, whatever he was going to do, we would have some sort of chance of catching his psycho ass on camera. You were more worried that he would go to your sister? Yes, I was. Because she was unprotected? Mm Mm-hmm. I felt like I had ruined something for him that looked like it was planned out. Now, why did you not call the police? because my mom didn't want to call the police. And that made me feel like she just felt hopeless at this point. We'd contacted the police every time something happened and they never helped us out. Deborah tells me she was skeptical of her daughter's account about seeing John. She thought Jacqueline had an overactive imagination. Jacqueline says she circled her sister's apartment complex over and over that night. She went to check her sister's apartment door, but she didn't knock because she didn't want to wake her. Um, She had a little cat with a a jingle collar on it. I tried the lock until uh, I heard her cat's little bell, like, come to the door and kind of rub his little body against the door. And she took reassurance from the growl of Tara's miniature Australian shepherd, Cash. So I was like, okay, cool. She's in the home with Cash. She's safe. I'm just tripping. I'm just tripping. So I would be like, I was kind of going through uh, times that night where I was like, oh my gosh, am I going crazy? Like, no, I'm actually not going crazy. This is really happening. Jacqueline says she was up until 4.30 a.m., slept for an hour and a half, and called Tara at 6 a.m. I said, "Um, John's in the area. Please be careful. I saw him last night. He had the lights off to the car. I followed him. He was in a white Camry. Um, How scared did she seem? She was like, oh, my gosh, you know, really? Like, okay, but... um, I don't think that she took it that day as seriously as I did. But in the dark, she had misidentified the car John was driving. Tara would be watching for the wrong one. It's one of the hypotheticals now. Would he have otherwise been able to get close to her? Tara Newell was 25. Descriptions of her almost always included the words sweet. Her voice was so soft that waiters had to lean in and ask her to repeat her order. As a kid, she was usually the smallest one on the recess yard, and so uncompetitive in softball games that she didn't even bother swinging at pitches. She had a huge heart for the smallest things. Yeah, that would describe her perfectly. So the classic wouldn't hurt a fly personality. Yeah, she wouldn't. Something that wasn't causing her any harm, no way. She's not very feisty. 
Tara was a child of affluent Orange County suburbs, but she adored country music, and she liked the songs about drinking beer, having a good time, and still loving God. Like the company of dogs, music made her forget her anxiety. For years, Tara had lived with a vague sense of dread. When she was around six, she woke up screaming, convinced that someone had climbed through her bedroom window to try and snatch her. She says the intruder dropped her and disappeared out the window. Her parents didn't call police. Her mother thought maybe it was a dream, the function of Tara's distress over what was happening in the house. Her parents were fighting a lot, and soon her dad left the house for good. Tara had frequent nightmares at that age. She'd see dark shapes and become convinced they were ghosts or aliens. Over the years, she says she wondered whether she was a little crazy. In therapy, she questioned whether the abduction memory was a real one, but became convinced it had actually happened. When she was a teenager, a guy she'd been dating flipped out and rammed a car into her leg. She says he was on meth. She got a tattoo on her foot that said Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, with a heart she'd seen in a Taylor Swift video. Early on, Tara sensed John was dangerous. She had sobbed uncontrollably at a Christmas gathering, saying there's just something wrong about him. I don't like him trying to convince people. But not everyone felt what she felt. For the longest time, her mother certainly didn't. Tara did not want to be alone in her Newport Beach apartment, even though, as far as she knew, her stepfather did not know her address. As often as possible, she had friends over to crash at her place. Well, the gate was always broken, so he could... He could follow me and just, like, be on the street and probably see where I parked. To be honest, I kind of feel like he was watching me for months. Just off and on, you know? So I would always, like, look back and see if anyone was there. Tara had premonitions of death. She wrote out a note and put it in her drawer. If anything happened to her, it said, she wanted her ex-boyfriend to get her dog. She says she had a dream that John was attacking her, And she had a knife, and she had to stab him to save herself. She wasn't a fighter and had no background in the martial arts, though she studied television violence with uncommon intensity. The Walking Dead was a reservoir of survival techniques, like biting, as demonstrated in the season four finale, when a character escapes a tight spot by opening a bad guy's jugular with his teeth. And they got surrounded by these group of guys, and they were trying to harass and do other stuff to them. And then Rick just um, bit off this guy's neck. So that reminded you, hey, my teeth are a weapon. Uh Uh-huh. Like, you pick up stuff from watching stuff or, like, hearing stuff. I'm more of a visual person, so... Like, how they hold the knife, I guess I knew how to hold a knife automatically. Um, Because if you hold it the other way, it's more easy to fall out of your hand and stuff. And then, What do you mean hold it the right way? Like, Well, you got to hold it tight so that you don't cut yourself. And um, then also, you hold it like kind of like you make a fist. Where if you hold it like a different way, then it's um, less control over the knife and someone's more easy to take it from you. And you learned all this from the show? That show and then Dexter and like all the other CSI shows. An important feature of zombie combat is that the enemy is undeterred unless you get it in the head. A stab to the head or a shot to the head and then you kill the zombie. They're already dead, but then they're undead, and you need to re-kill them, right? Yeah. You need to kill their brain. But it sounds like you absorbed a certain, like, mindset from the show more than any specific technique necessarily. Yeah. How would you describe that mindset? Um, kill or be killed. Are you hiring? Find your dream candidate with these tips from ZipRecruiter and Dirty John. Tip, stay ahead of the competition. It's perfectly acceptable to ask candidates which other employers they're considering. 
If your competitors for top talent are strong, think of what makes your company stand out, whether it's growth opportunities, benefits, or perks. To get the right candidate through the door, use ZipRecruiter to post your job to over 100 top job boards with one click. Their smart technology notifies qualified candidates to apply within minutes of posting. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. Try ZipRecruiter for free by visiting ZipRecruiter.com slash Dirty John. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Dirty John. This has been a tip for finding your dream candidate from Dirty John and ZipRecruiter. The smartest way to hire. Tara was working in Newport Beach at Rebel Run, a dog kennel. A man called with what sounded like a French accent. The man made it sound like they had met at some point and wanted to know if she would be working tomorrow. He wanted to bring in his Rhodesian Ridgebacks for her to groom. She didn't recognize the voice or remember having met him or think too much about the fact that most of the grooming requests came from women not men. She told the stranger her work schedule. Yes, she would be there tomorrow till about 5 p.m. The next morning was Saturday, August 20th, 2016, and Jacqueline called to warn her about John being in town. It would be a good idea to keep her pocket knife handy, her sister said. That morning at the dog kennel, she greeted the labs and terriers and Dobermans and poodle mixes. She unlocked the cages She carried the big bag of dried, high-protein pellets between the cages and filled the bowls. She hosed out the cages and the concrete dog runs. For this reason, and this is an important detail, she wore rain boots. The French-sounding guy who was supposed to bring in his Rhodesian Ridgebacks never showed, but she didn't think much of it. She was distracted, preoccupied by the concert at Irvine Meadows that night. She had bought $200 lawn seat tickets to see one of her favorite country stars, Jason Aldean, and was bringing a girlfriend. She left work in her Toyota Prius just after 5 p.m. for the three-mile drive home. Cash, the miniature Australian shepherd, was in the back seat. It was still full daylight. There was someone backed up into a parking spot. It was a Dodge Dart, I believe. And there was a man fidgeting in the back. I saw him with a tire arm. And my dog started to growl and bark at him. But I kind of thought it was a homeless man. (laughs) Just like living in his car and going through his stuff. So I just parked and did my spot and I parked face forward. And we don't have assigned parking, but I park in the same spot every single day. She says she carried bear mace in her car, a gift from her sister, and pepper spray in her purse, and a pocket knife, but at the moment she pulled into her parking spot, the knife was up in her apartment. John Meehan had removed the license plate from the gray 2016 Dodge Dart he had rented from Enterprise. Inside the car, he had assembled what police would call a kidnap kit. An Oakley backpack, camouflage duct tape, 13 cable ties useful for binding wrists and ankles, and six knives from a Belgique cookware set. He had a passport as if to flee the country. In his cup holder, he had a vial of injectable testosterone. He had been formidably big, six foot two and 230 pounds of steroidal muscle, a survivor of jail and prison cells in at least three states. He had lost serious weight over the months, He was down to 163 pounds, but his intended victim would still be a foot shorter and 33 pounds lighter. He would have the element of surprise. He would have the knife. It bore no resemblance to a fair fight. And then um, I got out of my car. I got my dog out of my car. And then I walked to the back license plate And um, John came up and grabbed me by the waist, put his arm around my waist, looked me in the eyes, and he said, do you remember me? And I didn't even respond to that. I just tried to get away from him. Um, He started grabbing me, trying to put his hand over my mouth. I bit him. I was pushing him trying to get away from him, he started to, like, punch me, I thought. 
but it turns out he was stabbing me and one of my automatic reflexes was to put my arm up to protect my chest and I also had my purse with me so he stabbed my purse a few times I believe and then he also got one in my arm that was one inch deep. We were just kind of wrestling for seconds but it seemed like forever it seemed like minutes and um i was just trying to run away from him but he kept on grabbing me and kept on trying to stab me we fell to the ground my dog was also attacking his ankles and biting him just going off on him and i fell onto the ground i fell on my back and he was on his knees with a knife, just trying to stab me. Three floors of apartments flanked the elevated outdoor parking lot at the Coronado's apartment complex. Overlooking the scene where John Meehan attacked Tara Newell were long rows of windows and balconies. Dozens of them, even scores, afforded a clear view. It was a clear, bright day. Blonde, small-boned Skylar Sepulveda, 14 years old, didn't know Tara, but looked like she could have been her little sister. She had just pedaled home from junior lifeguard training at the Balboa Pier on her beach cruiser. She was in apartment T302, wearing only a T-shirt-covered swimsuit when she heard the screaming and went to the window. She saw Tara struggling on her back on the far side of the parking lot a few hundred feet away, and John Meehan above her. I... We'll never get those screams out of my head. He had a knife. The knife was a long silver blade that was shining. He was holding it over his head, and that was the last thing that I saw out of the window before I started running. Skylar told her mom to call police and grabbed her beach towel. Newport Beach 911. There's a man up here with a knife and a girl screaming. Barefoot, she bolted out the door and rushed down two flights of apartment stairs. My daughter is taking a towel to her right now because somebody else she's bleeding. So we're running over there right okay, now. Okay, they the need to go to post three. She's bleeding. It's really bad. There's All right, I understand. Screaming. We have officers on the way. Like, mommy, somebody's screaming, somebody's screaming. And then she saw this guy just raising his hand up and down, up and down. Okay, all right. Skylar had wrists so thin a grown man could have enclosed them with a single hand. She did not pause long enough to worry that the attacker might turn the knife on her when she got to the scene. She just knew that she would blame herself if something awful happened that she could have stopped. And I had to run up another long flight of stairs up to the top of the parking structure. And once I got to the top, I had to run almost diagonally to where they were. And it probably took me under two minutes to run there. I thought it was incredible that people could let and witness other people being abused or just even their life being possibly taken away and just watching it happen and not stepping in to try and help. I think majority of it was just the kind of place that it was. By that, she means it was a big, anonymous, block-long apartment complex where it was common to overhear domestic arguments and common to ignore them. They thought it was just another altercation that was happening there. They just dismissed it and thought it was normal. The rain boots Tara wore that day were her sturdy pair with thick tread, and it's possible that played a role in what happened next. She was on her back, using her feet and legs to protect herself as he stabbed at her. And I kept on pedal kicking him and trying to block the knife. Um, and then seconds later, just doing this, um, I knocked the knife out of his hand. The knife flew through the air. It landed on the pavement. It landed inches from her right hand. It landed with a handle pointed toward her. I didn't give it a second thought, and it just started willing on him and stabbing him. Because I know that if I didn't fight back and wound him, he would continue to try to hurt me and possibly kill me. She connected again and again his shoulder, his shoulder blade, 
his triceps, his shoulder blade, his upper back, his shoulder blade, his upper back, between his shoulder blades, his forearm, his triceps, his shoulder, his chest, his left eye, and through it into his brain. She heard him gasp as he fell heavily on top of her. The last one was in the eye. The very last one? Uh Uh-huh. And so I guess that was my zombie kill. Someone's been stabbed and he attacked a girl. It's a girl and her dog and then a guy is on the ground. Um, I'm not really sure what happened. We just heard her screaming. Do you see blood? blood here. Yes, and uh, the guy's just on the ground. When she reached the scene, Skylar Sepulveda found John Meehan face down, bleeding and convulsing. Tara was crawling away, shaking, screaming about how he had stalked her and tortured her family. She was terrified that John would get up and attack her again. Skylar saw the wound on Tara's forearm and she began to wrap it with her beach towel, tightly the way they taught her in junior lifeguards. There was a gash where you could see blood and muscle and tissue, for sure. It was the deepest cut that I've ever seen in real life. And I knew that she just needed to calm down in order to properly get better because screaming and flailing her arms would not have helped the bleeding. So I was doing my best to try and tell her that it was okay and that he wasn't gonna hurt her anymore and that she was safe. She started talking and she also tried to calm me down, just started asking me questions. And then I realized I was just in hysterics, so she started to ask me question, random questions about other stuff, like, when's my birthday? Like, where were you going to go tonight? Others had arrived to help. And then the other guy went to go check on John, and that's when I called my dog back over to me, and... I ran down the hill because I I couldn't I couldn't be around him. I was scared he was gonna wake up and try to hurt me again and hurt this guy and just like blow past him and try to get me. Um so I ran down to the hill with my dog and with my arm like wrapped in the towel. And then I asked her to get my phone. She ran and she got my phone. I called my mom and I told her, I'm really, really sorry. I think I killed your husband. And my mom was in hysterics and she was like, what? I don't understand. And then I just kept on telling her, I think I killed your husband. John tried to kill me and I stopped him. And um, she was like, okay, I'm on my way. Do you have an emergency? Yeah, we do. We got um, a woman. Breathe. Come on. It's a, you had this a male and a female. Dude, breathe. The male's not doing well. It's said West and Dover. Breathe. Okay. Females hold, hold on one second. Hold on one second. John Meehan was not breathing when the police arrived and had no pulse. But they administered CPR, and soon his pulse was back, and he began to take small, short breaths on his own. Subject was moved to ICU-18. Roger, ICU-18. They rushed him to Orange County Global Medical Center in Santa Ana. Paramedics tried to load Tara into the ambulance for the trip to Hogue Hospital. I wouldn't let them put the IV in me or anything until they gave me my dog back. And so Cash came with me, and then I let them put the IV in. He rode in with me in the ambulance, and um, they were asking me questions, and I just told them I really wanted to go to the Jason Aldean concert. They told me, I don't think you're going to be able to go tonight. And so they felt bad for me, and then they turned on some country music to just try to calm me. I asked if he was dead, 
if I killed him. And they said that I did, but then they revived him, and he was brain dead. I was kind of upset that they tried to revive him and waste, like, time and effort and medical dollars and all of that just to do, keep this evil man alive. But then they told me that it's good to keep him alive so that we could possibly use his organs and help save other people. So at least his life wouldn't be completely a waste. It's a testament to the impression that John made that even now, he seemed larger than he was. Not a human being, but a horror movie villain who might spring bolt upright from his deathbed, animated by sheer rage, to attack again. Word of what happened reached Tara's cousin, Shad Vickers. He rushed to the hospital to be sure Tara was all right. You know, I was, I just knew, I just, I was like, if he comes out of this, it's, this is over. It's going to be horrible. That's how good I thought he was, is I thought he was going to, get out of this coma that he was in, get out of his, his criminal issues, and either strike another family or come to us. John's sister Donna, who had tried more than anyone to help him over the years, who had seen him turn viciously on her too, got the news from her lawyer. At first, she didn't rule out the possibility of some trick. John knew every kind. I said... I don't know. It could be a story. It could be John doing something. Donna didn't go to the hospital where her brother lay unconscious, covered with 13 stab wounds. I never saw John. I never did. I didn't want to say goodbye. I had already said my goodbyes. John's other sister, Karen Duvalet, was summoned to the hospital. Deborah Newell did not want to be responsible for pulling the plug on her husband. She thought Duvalet should decide. Duvalet is a nurse. She looked at the brain scans and realized her brother had no chance. She gave the okay to pull him off life support. A transplant team tried to harvest his organs, but years of drug use had ravaged them. John Michael Meehan, drug addict, failed law student, disgraced nurse anesthetist, fake doctor, prolific grifter, black-hearted Lothario and terror of uncountable women, was declared dead at age 57 on August 24th, four days after he attacked Tara Newell. Deborah and Karen were led to a room in a Santa Ana funeral home where his body lay in a long, plain cardboard box. They watched the lid go on the box and the box go in the oven. The door closed. He turned into black smoke, and that was all. There was no memorial service. Tara struggled with guilt. It helped to talk to Meehan's sisters. This is Donna. I brought her flowers, and I thanked her. I said he could have made it a lot worse for a lot of people the rest of his life. You know, he he did a good thing. Sounds weird, but he was a bad person. But I think it helped. I don't know. Everyone who heard the story had the same question. How did she prevail? I asked Shad what sense he could make of it. Zero. Zero makes sense. And that dog is a tiny dog. Impossible. There's no way. When I first met Shad, he used a sentence that's hard to forget. The last person on earth I'd ever think would send John to hell would be Tara. And so what is it that's, uh, that was in you that gave you the ability to survive there. Can you talk about that? Well, I had a genuine hate for him. This guy was taking away my mom. It's possible to make some educated guesses about what else contributed to the outcome. John's body was likely weakened by his drug use and fatigue. The autopsy report reflected how much his health had deteriorated over the last year. At 163 pounds, he was 67 pounds lighter than he was listed on his driver's license. Tara had the gift of adrenaline, and she probably didn't know what kind of fight she had in her until she needed it. 
Her gentle demeanor was deceptive. Her size was certainly deceptive. For years, she'd worked with big, aggressive dogs. Her upper body is built like a swimmer's, strong, round shoulders. I think of him as pure evil. I think that if there is a devil, then he's probably the devil or the devil's son. I, like, I've had a dream about this moment, and I would actually stab and kill him, but then I never knew it would happen, and I never thought, like, oh, I'm watching the show, and maybe this show might help save my life one day. I just thought, if there's a zombie apocalypse, then maybe I might know what to do. Detectives told the prosecutor, Matt Murphy, that it looked like a clear case of self-defense. 99 times out of 100, you're, uh, you know, the nice person is the one that winds up dead. I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, this guy's on the run after this, and we find the, this poor woman dead and duct taped in the desert or on the side of a freeway, because um, that's usually the way these things end. I don't think this went according to plan for me. What he expected to do, I believe, was to pull out the knife and she would do, again, what we see on TV. She would, you know, maybe at worst he's got a muffle of scream, but he'd be able to, with the knife, get her into his vehicle and, and kidnap her, which is what all the stuff was doing inside, inside the car. So he's got to move her from, you know, her world into his, and she decided to fight. And that's, that's where things went wrong. I think it's basically an illusion fostered by the movies we love and our need for comprehensible narratives governed by cause and effect that people's personalities can never really be explained by an event or two. Still, when you're writing a story, you're always looking for some burning insight, some skeleton key that might unlock a person's personality. You rarely find tidy answers, and sometimes nothing resembling any answer at all. You're not going to get the incinerated sled at the end of Citizen Kane, the convenient image that makes you say, ah, so that's what warped this guy's soul. What made Dirty John Dirty John? The prosecutor did not seem vexed by the elusive origins of John's consummate dirtiness. The fact is, some people are just born bad. They just are. And from everything I wrote about Mr. Meehan, he's one of those guys. There's no traumatic event in his life. There's no head injury. There's nothing that happened that I'm aware of that you can look at and say, look, his whole, everything went bad for him at this point. Murphy even has a phrase for it, which he picked up during his years prosecuting sex crimes. He says certain predators just have, quote, green worms in the brain. You can't explain how they got there, and you can't get them out. I talked to Deborah's family law attorney, Michael O'Neill. I just think he was so wrapped up in the in the quest, the the stalking, and the reason I I akin it to sharks is their behavior. What was his end game? Each one of them was to get money, but I tend to think that the end game it was the game. John Meehan never left a note explaining what he had intended to do. Maybe he had planned to kidnap Tara and hold her for ransom to get Deborah's money. Maybe he wanted to punish Deborah by killing Tara, which is the explanation that seems most plausible to me. And that's what my uncle and my dad would say. If you want to get revenge, you don't put revenge upon who you're mad at. You harm the people they love. This is Donna again. And if anything comes out of this, Chris, that if there's any women out there that just feel, oh my God, how did I not see it? How did I not know? You know, it, it happened to me too. And I, and I was the only one that ever helped him. And he did it to me. Do you there, think there, that there are a lot of women out there who don't know that he's dead, who are still living in fear of him? Yes. Yes. There has to be. There has to be. Tara had to quit her job at the dog kennel because the anxiety was paralyzing. Barking dogs triggered memories of the attack. 
Sometimes she'd see a man roughly John's age, and she struggled to breathe. For a while, she smoked pot to get to sleep, but it made her paranoid and irritable. So she quit, but then nightmares flooded her sleep. She told me she found a therapist who's helping her. She says part of it is learning not to use animals as an emotional crutch quite as much, and part of it is imagining a safe spot where she can go in her mind when things feel overwhelming. And for me, it's a lake um, where I was fishing when I was little with my father in Montana, and then my dog wasn't with me then, but I put him in the picture as my protector. Deborah Newell still struggles with guilt that she brought John into her family's life. There is much about him she will probably never know. After his death, she went to the house in Henderson, Nevada, where he had been staying, and found it strewn with needles and painkillers. On a laptop he had used, she found a list of women and their phone numbers. There might have been 200 of them. Some were identified by their anatomical parts. On the day they were married, it turned out, he had been on three dating websites. He had about 15 winks or comments that day from girls. And he had sent some, and I thought, we're getting married. Who in the world does that? And that's what made me feel like none of this was real. She says she doesn't have any desire to date a year after his death. She's content with her life. She's close with her kids again. She recently bought her daughters stun guns, pepper spray, and rape whistles. They talk every day, sometimes just to say I love you. She doesn't need a boyfriend or a husband. She says she feels like she's over John. She's concluded that he didn't know how to love, that he was some kind of sociopath. But it took her a long time to understand that. In the months after his death, it was hard, trying to figure out what was real and what wasn't. Was it possible that he had been lying every time he touched her and every time he smiled at her? One of the first times I met Deborah, she showed me footage of their Las Vegas wedding on her iPad. She clicked on it. Deborah, will you take John to be your wedded husband to live together in Bonds of Mary? There they were at the altar exchanging rings. Please face each other and hold hands. She was rubbing his hand. He was smiling at her tenderly. John, please repeat after me. I, John. I, John. Take Deborah. Take Deborah. Watching it now, she had to turn away. She had a catch in her throat. Deborah, will you take John to be your wedded husband to live together in Bonds of Marriage? We love him, comfort him, honor, and keep him so long as you both show up. Yes. She asked me, doesn't he look happy? Dirty John is reported and written by me, your host, Christopher Gofford, for the Los Angeles Times. Karen Lowe is our producer and editor. Audio design by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. During this production, our LA Times team has included Shelby Grad, Steve Clow, Robert Meeks, and Devon Maharaj. Thanks to Rick Loomis and sound engineer Ravi Carmen. We owe a special acknowledgement to the work of Hannah Fry the reporter who broke the story of Meehan's death for her newspaper, The Daily Pilot, and who contributed research to this project. You can read the story at latimes.com. We're putting up installments as these episodes air. And check the website for photos of this story. We'd also love to learn more about you. Please go to wondery.com forward slash survey. Thank you for listening. Well, devil's got your boyfriend. He's got the one who said he'd always love you. He'd never Hi, it's Christopher Gofford. Dirty John is about love, deception, and one extremely dangerous man. If you liked our show, the young Charles Manson is the focus of season two of Hollywood and Crime. And I'm Tracy Patton, the host of the Wondery show, Hollywood and Crime. 
As we saw in Dirty John, psychopaths don't come from nowhere. They're born. They have childhoods and teen years and really whole lives before they become the people we hear about. So how did a troubled kid from West Virginia become Charles Manson? Join me and Stephen Lang from the hit films Avatar and Don't Breathe in Young Charlie as we journey into the mind of one of the most infamous psychopaths ever to stalk Hollywood. Let's start the journey right now with this special preview of Young Charlie. And don't forget to subscribe and listen to Young Charlie on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Or if you're listening on a smartphone, swipe or tap the cover art to find a link to take you there. Young Charlie from Hollywood and Crime contains depictions of violence and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. At a little after 8 a.m. on the morning of August 9, 1969, housekeeper Winifred Chapman approached the grounds of 10,050 Cielo Drive. As she got to the gate, she noticed a loose wire dangling above the control box. Already late, thanks to L.A.'s poor bus system, she was now concerned that the electricity might be out. But when she pressed the button, the gate swung open as it did every morning. Relieved, she entered the property. Only a few yards up from the gate, she noticed a white rambler at an oblique angle in the driveway. Several other vehicles were parked closer to the garage. Since overnight visitors were a common occurrence at the sprawling estate, she thought nothing of it. Entering the house through the service porch, Mrs. Chapman picked up the kitchen phone and noticed it was dead. Wondering if it could be due to the downed wire, she replaced the receiver. She headed for the living room, but was blocked by two large blue steamer trunks that hadn't been there when she'd left work the day before. They looked as if they'd been knocked over, one leaning against the other. Then she noticed the blood, smeared across the trunks, on the floor nearby, on two towels lying in the living room entryway. For a moment she stood there, uncomprehending. Only now did she realize she hadn't heard a sound since entering the house. Forcing herself to move, she stepped toward the living room. Everywhere she looked, there was more blood. On the floor, the rugs, the furniture. The front door was half open, and two red pools spread across the porch. Beyond, she could see a body sprawled on the front lawn. Screaming, she ran from the house and down the driveway. This time, she noticed the body of a young man lying sideways across the front seat of the Rambler. She managed to get the gate open and fled to a neighboring house. Uh, We have five dead bodies. There are three male bodies and two female bodies. Movie star Sharon Tate and four other persons were murdered. The scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite. Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate when he said, In all my years, I have never seen anything like this before. As the sun rose higher on another sweltering day, Los Angeles residents would begin to learn about the events that had taken place hours earlier and struggle to find ways to understand them. In the early morning of August 9, 1969, five people had been savagely murdered in the tony reaches of the Hollywood Hills. They had been shot and stabbed and bludgeoned. Nooses had been hung round their necks. The owner of the house had pled for the life of her unborn child as she was stabbed repeatedly in the chest. This would not be a night for mercy. What the victims would never know was that the author of their gruesome deaths had not been present. He had been in the wilds outside Los Angeles planning the next acts in a drama begun many years ago and a thousand miles away. In the ensuing days, the killings would seem a portent worthy of a desert prophet. The rich would cower in their mansions, while the poor went on with their lives unworried. Former peace activists would empty the racks of local gun stores. Rival police teams would overlook clues to advance comfortable theories. It was as if the country were looking into a funhouse mirror reflection of biblical prophecy, Lions would not lie down with lambs, but be slaughtered by them. Only 19 days earlier, Americans had reveled in humankind's great achievement in setting foot on the moon. 
Now they were forced to look into the darkest recesses of our animal nature. Days later, the love generation would dance in the mud of Woodstock while authorities attempted to come to grips with the Cielo Drive murders. Untroubled by the police, the killers would retreat to their Death Valley abode, awaiting the Armageddon they hoped to initiate. Their Messiah would lead them in search of the bottomless pit, where, he had told them, they would hide out for a hundred years before re-emerging to rule the world. After all, the Beatles had predicted it. August 1st, 1939. A gray convertible Packard drives along a dark country road just outside Charleston, West Virginia. Behind the wheel is Frank Martin, who for at least part of the evening considered himself a lucky man. In the passenger seat beside him is Kathleen Maddox, a young woman he met only an hour ago at the Blue Moon Beer Parlor. She might not be destined for Hollywood, but she's outgoing and friendly, and seems like the kind of girl willing to let the night take them where it may. Frank had flashed a wad of bills, and she was all eyes, talking big about getting a hotel room for the night. But they were barely in his car when she'd changed her mind, and the hotel room turned into a trip to a nearby dance hall. Things didn't look much better when she asked him to pick up her brother Luther en route. But Frank was easygoing about it. Who knew how the evening might turn out? They're barely out of town, barreling down an unlit road when Luther, sitting in the back, says to pull over. Frank's not doing any such thing. If this guy needs to use the can, he can damn well wait till they get to the dance hall. Next thing Frank knows, something hard is pressed between his shoulder blades, and affable Luther turns dead serious. I mean it, he growls, pressing his point with another poke in Frank's back. Damn, thinks Frank as he pulls the Packard off the road. This evening has definitely taken a turn for the worse. Kathleen watches as the two men get out of the car. It's then that Frank notices the ketchup bottle in Luther's hand. If that doesn't take the prize, being stuck up by a ketchup bottle. Frank has had about enough of these two. He turns back to the car when, crack, this joker pastes him one alongside the head with the bottle, knocking him to the ground. Frank is seeing stars and coughing road dust, feeling hands reaching for his wallet. When he can see straight again, what he sees is the two of them, brother and sister, driving off into the night in his gray Packard coupe. To make it worse, he's pretty sure he can hear them laughing. LAPD officer Jerry Joe DeRosa was first to arrive at the ASIN residence, next door to 10,050 Cielo Drive in the Hollywood Hills. Homeowner Ray Asen had called the police after opening his door to a hysterical Winifred Chapman. The housekeeper had been shouting incoherently about blood and bodies everywhere. DeRosa couldn't get much more than that out of her. He learned from Mr. Asen that the neighboring property had been rented to film director Roman Polanski and his wife, an actress named Sharon Tate. Two friends, Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski, had been staying there while the couple was in Europe, though Mrs. Polanski had recently returned. Mrs. Chapman managed to get out the name of hairstylist Jay Sebring, whose black Porsche she'd seen parked near the garage. DeRosa returned to his squad car for his rifle, then approached the Polanski home with Mrs. Chapman. She remained outside the gate as the officer stepped onto the grounds. Immediately, he saw the body of a young man slumped sideways across the front seat of the Rambler, his clothes drenched in blood. There was no need to check for a pulse. Moments later, LAPD officer William Weisenhunt arrived, grabbing his shotgun. He joined DeRosa in the driveway as a third LAPD patrol car pulled up, and Officer Robert Burbridge got out. The three officers approached the main house. About 20 feet from the front door, a man lay on his side in the grass, colorfully attired in bell-bottoms and purple shirt. He appeared to have dozens of stab wounds. His face was battered beyond recognition. About 25 feet away, a young woman lay on her back, her arms splayed outwards. She was barefoot, dressed in what had been a white nightgown, now red from the multiple stab wounds to her torso. 
DeRosa remained on the lawn watching the front door for possible perpetrators, while Wisenhunt and Burbridge went around the side of the house. Wisenhunt noticed a window screen had been slit along the bottom, perhaps by the assailants. Farther on, they found an open window and looked inside. The two officers climbed inside the house. This has been a special preview of Young Charlie, out now. To listen to the rest of this episode, subscribe to Young Charlie on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. Or if you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe the cover art to find a link that will take you there.